we on this plane, with our experience, we don't really have the ability to comprehend it. It's not that they don't want to explain it, it's just there isn't a language, really. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Blue Blocks. These guys are changing the game when it comes to blue blocking eyewear. They've got a complete range of evidence-backed blue light blocking glasses to suit your every need, all different shapes and sizes. But what's even cooler is they now do prescription and reading glasses with their world-renowned blue blocking lenses. Simply upload your prescription at checkout and they do the rest. Blue Blocks also offers a really epic send in your own frame service. So you can send in some old sunglass frames that you like and they will turn those into blue blockers. You can find all of this at blueblocks.com. That's B L U B L O X. So if you want to protect your eyes, your sleep, your melatonin, your brain, and be seen perfectly into your old age, you definitely want to get some Blue Blocks. All right. While you're there, make sure to pick up a Remedy Sleep Mask. Did you know that light hitting your eyes, even when they're closed, is enough to raise your blood sugar levels and suppress melatonin. Yeah, that's right. You know when you're in a hotel and like light just sneaks in from everywhere? You can fix that with the Remedy Sleep Mask. It's got zero eye pressure. It's super comfortable. It's really well designed, very high quality. You can get all of that over at blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X. Enter the code LIFESTYLIST and save 15% off. That's blueblocks.com. I want you to use your imagination for a moment. Take a second and just imagine a probiotic that actually works. One that actually does what it's supposed to do. Heal your gut. When you find the right probiotic, the one that works, it's like winning the gut lottery. That's where our friends at Just Thrive Probiotic come in. Just Thrive Probiotic is the first and only 100% all-natural, spore-form, DNA-verified and tested probiotic supplement. That means it has 100% survivability. It makes it through your digestive tract and does its magic in there because it doesn't get killed on the way down. It's got clinically proven strains for leaky gut. They're doing nine other ongoing human clinical trials. This is a really powerful way to support your immune system and your brain. Now, your brain really depends on the health of your gut. So not only does having a jacked up gut suck because you get all bloated and gassy and the leaky gut issues and all that, but your brain really depends on the health of your gut. And our friends over at Just Thrive have nailed it when it comes to a product that really works. You take one capsule per day with meal and you're done. You're going to heal that gut. You're going to improve your digestion. And this is how I've recently really helped my digestion and my gut health overall because I've always had problems with that. And it's getting better and better the longer I use the Just Thrive probiotic. It has completely changed the game for me. And I wanted to change the game for you. So if you want to make that happen, it's super easy. Just get over to thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. That's thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. And when you use the code Luke15 over there, you're going to save 15% off your order. That's Luke15 at thriveprobiotic.com forward slash Luke. The fact that you're hearing my voice would indicate to me that you've probably got some good karma because this episode is such a gift and such a treat. Today's guest is Ainsley McLeod. This is Old Soul Present Mission, Healing Past Life Trauma. And uh, I got to say, man, this was a truly inspiring and awakening conversation. I first heard Ainsley, I believe, on Oprah's podcast, then my friend Lacey Phillips' podcast, and he's been on my list for quite some time. And uh, I was finally able to track him down and make this happen. And uh, he did not disappoint, let's put it that way. Before we get into what we talk about during this episode, I'd like to invite you to join me next Tuesday, where I interview my doctor, Craig Conover, about cutting-edge performance medicine. We talk peptides, NAD, ketamine, all kinds of crazy stuff. He's on to some wild next-level 
uh, medicine practice over there. So make sure you subscribe to the show so you don't miss next Tuesday's episode with Dr. Craig Conover. Let's talk about Ainsley McLeod, though, because he's really the star of the show. He's got an amazing new book called The Old Soul's Guidebook. He also has a fantastic community called Soul World Membership, which you'll likely want to join after hearing this episode. If you're not familiar with Ainsley's work, he's an internationally acclaimed past life psychic, spiritual teacher, and award-winning author who specializes in exploring past lives to reveal your life's purpose. And man, does he ever do that in this episode. What we talk about is his initial discovery of his spirit guide gift and the fact that all spirit guides were once human. We also discuss how spirit guides evolve from other life forms and how we can know when we contact spirit guides that they are benevolent and well-meaning and not misguided lost souls with bad intentions. We discuss at depth the 10 soul levels, the difference between spirit and soul, why some people get hung up on being an old soul versus a new one, the fact that many people have visions of past lives during plant medicine ceremonies, how the Vedic system teaches that you work your way up through lifetimes until it's not necessary to incarnate again, why souls come into existence in groups, then meet up over and over again in multiple lives, why it sometimes takes so long to meet your soulmate. Then Ainsley does an impromptu reading on me to determine my soul type and age and my life's purpose, and man, was he 100% spot on. Really fun to have the opportunity to get a reading from Ainsley live on the show, and I think you'll enjoy it too. All right, so get ready to dive into the deep end of the spiritual pool here with our brilliant and very kind guest, Ainsley McLeod. Ainsley, great to meet you. Welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to have this conversation. You've been on my list of guests that I've wanted to track down for probably about two years. And that guest is always being added to you know, almost on a daily basis. And so there's probably about a hundred people on that list that I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And then uh, she uh, DM'd me. I was like, hey, you should I have Ainsley on the show? And I thought, oh yes, that's on my list. All right, I'm going to do it now. And then so I'm really- oh, That's great. Bless, bless India. Yeah. And so I'm really glad that we're able to uh, to dive in here and um, and get this going. So yeah. I'd like to start with how you first discovered your gift. Uh, well, that's a, you know, that's a bit of a story because, uh, you know, generally people are kind of, you're born with a gift, you know, I mean, it's, it's like any talent. You come into the world with it, you know, it's the same as having a talent for music or something. But if you never get a chance to use it, then you may not be aware you have it. And I was, I went for decades not thinking I had any psychic abilities. And even though I kept running into psychics, I was a total non-believer. I mean, for a huge chunk of my life. And I had no time for people who were in that sort of like, you know, woo-woo spiritual thing or, you know, church going or whatever, you know. It was just like, you know, I put it down to weak minds or something like that. And I kept, yet I kept hearing from people that I was psychic. Uh, psychics even approached me in public places to let me know. And I, of course, I just thought they were crazy. Um, and it was, there's a sort of moment um, I mean, after I mean, to be honest, the spirit world just kept, you know, whacking me across the back of the head with a, you know, stick trying to get my attention, and uh, so there were a, a lot of wake up calls. But the one that really got my attention, I talk about this all the time because it really was so. Uh, I mean, it was just even now I look back and I go, oh my God, that was so huge. I ran into my uncle in a bookstore in Hawaii. I was on a trip there, and. Uh, he'd, he'd actually been dead for 10 years at that point. So it was a little bit of a surprise uh, seeing him. But I just, you know, suddenly he was just there. He was like a foot away from me and just like real as life and then gone, but with a very clear message about working together. So I, I then thought, I just have to, you know, bite the bullet here. So I just, um, I waited until I was back on the mainland and then I just, so one evening I just go, okay, so, you know, I keep hearing how John's a spirit guide. I should be working with him and uh, let's give it a try. So um, I found that I could connect. I just, it wasn't very strong or anything back then. It took a lot of work to, to kind of develop it to the, 
the point that it is now where, you know, when I, I mean, when I communicate with spirit guides now, it's like just, it's like talking to a friend or something. Early days, it was like, like pulling teeth. It was like really hard, you know, and certainly moments where I thought I could never make a career out of this, you know, it's like, um, four hours to get a simple piece of information or something. So, you know, that's, you couldn't have a client waiting that long to find out their life purpose or whatever. So I, um, I just started working um, with, first of all, with my uncle, and then he passed me over to the spirit guides that I work with uh, right now and have been working with some variation on these spirit guides. Uh, they, they shift them off a little bit over time, uh, but I've been working with them now for almost, well, it must be about 20 years. And uh, actually, when I think about it, over 20 years. And um, of course, I've radically, you know, changed my mind about spirit world, you know, um, I'm no longer a non-believer, <laughs> certainly believe, you know, in spirits, uh, you can no longer be an atheist when, you, when you're talking to spirit guides, I guess. So th- that was really how I got to, to do it. And I just started um, practicing, practicing all the time and uh, just honing the skill and, uh, and uh, started reading people. It's, I took quite a while before I got the, the courage going to be able to, to read people. I was very worried about getting things wrong, you know, screwing up somebody's life with the wrong bit of information. So um, I, I was really sort of like, I, I didn't want to sort of go out and present what I do publicly until I, I really felt confident about what I do. So that, that took a good long, long, long time. I, and I often talk about this because I think a lot of people think like, uh, if you're intuitive, you just suddenly come out of the box. You know, you, like I say, you're born with that talent. And I think people think, oh, yeah, you just shoot from the hip, things just come to you. But I found that it's like any talent, whether it be music or art or whatever, you have to, you have to or can develop it. You know, people say, uh, you know, can I do what you do? And I go, sure, you know, but are you prepared to put in the time? And I think that's the, the thing. It, it really does require commitment and um practice you know it's a learned skill so like any talent you wouldn't just expect to pick up a violin and be able to play it like a a master in the first time right you know so it's like anything else was your uncle john uh a spiritually minded fellow himself no he was he wasn't he was he was an atheist like me i mean he um he became an atheist after uh, World War Two, you know, seeing all the death and destruction and so on, that really had a big effect on him. And so that's when I when I was hearing from spirit guides, they'd say, "Oh, your uncle John's a spirit guide. He wants to work with you." And I go, "He's the last person I think would be working as a spirit guide." And 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 the skeptic in me was almost saying, "Oh, yeah, everybody's got an uncle John. It's a bit of an easy guess, you know." So, uh, so I sort of downplayed it. But that's why I say I, mean, I, I had so many wake up calls that I just ignored or didn't recognize as, as wake-up calls. I should have probably been doing what I was doing 10 years before, you know, but a slow slow learner or something. Um, but yeah, so no, he, he wasn't, my uncle wasn't a spiritual guy. He was a, he's an old soul. He's a good, good guy and everything, but not at all interested in that sort of thing. But of course, when you go over to the other side, you see the world very differently. I mean, the perspective from the astral plane is very different to what it is here. What are the different planes of awareness or consciousness, according to your understanding? Well, the, the only three that I ever deal with, so I don't really know if, if there's anything beyond, but it's just uh, we have the physical plane, obviously, where we live and where we're, we're in bodies. The, the next level where we go when we pass is the astral plane. And that's where we go to process the life that we've had and to plan for the next one. Uh, it's where we go between lives continually until we're kind of finished with all our incarnations. But the 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 other level is uh, you know, they call the causal plane, and that's where the spirit guides that I work with. So my uncle was on the astral plane; he passed me over to these causal plane spirit guides. And the difference is really uh, that on on that higher plane, if you like, there's more access to things like your your life plan, your past lives, uh, other people, all the connections, the agreements that you have, where the, the view from the 
astral plane is a little bit, I mean, it's better than we get here, but it's a little bit sort of like still with the blinders on. So um, that's, uh, um, you know, a lot of um, people uh, you know, who do what I do, they, they connect with the, the astral plane, certainly mediums, you know, connecting with the astral plane where, you know, for the freshly deceased would, would reside. Um, it's a little trickier communicating with, with the causal plane, but it's, uh, it's very rewarding because it really does, well, that's why I'm able to work with people and see their past lives and see how, how it connects to the present, which is, you know, really where the work I do has sort of ended up. Do you reckon that in both of those planes that are outside of this physical plane that they exist in a quantum field? Is that a way that one could understand that? Um, meaning that a place of no time and no space, uh, a world of wave rather than uh, form? Does that um, make sense? But well, yeah. well, it makes sense to me. I'm not a scientist at all. I have, you know, no, I, I mean, I love science. I'm fascinated nope. by it. That's me. But, <laughs> but I, I, I don't have that kind of mind at all. I'm very much more sort of psychic, arty kind of thing. Um, so my spirit guides wouldn't use that sort of vocabulary with me. Um, what they talk about is that everything is um, energetic. And when they're talking about, uh, you know, even when they're describing these planes of existence, they'll use terms that, that are, you know, you, they'd be, they have to find language. They say they have to find metaphors and so on, you know. So uh, everything is happening energetically on the other side. You know, when they, when they talk about maybe seeing what somebody's doing on a physical plane, well, you're existing as energy. You don't technically have eyes, but you are, you, but you are able to see it. So. What they often say to me is that the, they have to use metaphors, they have to use language that, that we'd understand, um, but everything is happening on this energetic level that we really can't fully understand. It's just not, we, we, we on this plane, with our experience, we don't really have the ability to comprehend it. It's not that they don't want to explain it, it's just there isn't a language, really. Right. It's kind of beyond this paradigm of understanding because the intellect is required for us to conceptualize things and the intellect is limited in the spiritual realm, right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, and that happens with a lot of people I work with, you know, they're very thinkerly, very, very rational types. And they, they always want to sort of, you know, dig down deeper, you know, and I'll explain this further and everything. Sometimes you, just, you know, there just are not words. You just have to accept something or, uh, you know, put some trust, although not blind faith or anything, but, you know, maybe allow things to unfold or, or whatever. Don't, don't micromanage your, your life plan. <laughs> I think we, we as humans have that tendency to want to, when we want to arrive at a solution or an understanding, we are misled to believe that the intellect is the only means by which we can arrive yeah. at understanding, right? When in fact, um, it sounds like in your experience and certainly in mine subjectively that some of the most profound realizations have completely transcended my intellectual understanding. And it's just totally when, when they take place, you just know, and you couldn't even explain to someone how you know, right? Uh, trying to explain sky to a fish. It's just in a different realm that is is out of reach uh, at that particular level. So oh, totally, that's that's exactly how it is. Sometimes you just really have to find a way to sideline the rational part of the mind. You know, just just to be able to stay in that more sort of intuitive uh, part of you. Um, you know, I often get people, for example, saying, "Well, I can't do a past life regression, or I can't seem to connect with my spirit guides," and usually the problem is just being. You're overthinking it, you know, just taking too intellectual an approach. And sometimes you really do have to just just go into that other realm. That's why um, why we meditate, for example, is to try and, you know, we still the, the, the chatter and then be able to connect. You know, do you to, that there are ever times, uh, say, if you, if you do, in fact, still practice a more classical meditation, are there times where you find that you don't want to be in communication with the spirit guides yet they persistently kind of bug you and interject into your awareness. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to my spirit guides all the time. So I'd say not, not so much now, but certainly there have been times when they were trying to get my attention. Um, there have been different uh, variations on that. I mean, some, the, the, because I use spirit guides for working with clients, uh, they, they do have a lot of power. I was very stressed after years ago coming out of uh, divorce. And uh, the spirit guys were saying, you know, you really need to meditate. And I was going, yeah, well, look, I did, I did 15 minutes. It was, it was grueling. It was really hard, you know, with all the stress and everything. And they're going, well, we're not going to talk to you unless you do an hour. <laughs> and it's like, whoa. Wow. And sure enough, you know, they have the power. Um, and, and, I mean, it's a, it, you know, they've got a sense of humor, too. I mean, it's like a, a lighthearted way, but basically saying, no, we can't work with you unless you really, you have to still the mind. You have to get into that um, altered state a little bit. I mean, when I'm working with people now, um, and this has been this way for years, but when I first started, I would have to do this great long meditation. I'd have to really go into, you know, work to get to this altered space where I could communicate with the guides clearly. Now I can, uh, what I do is sit down five minutes before a session, check in with spirit guides, find out maybe a past life about the person I can get in just in that short, maybe 10 minutes I usually take just to, to center, to slightly alter the state I'm in and get some information uh, about the person. Um, and that just becomes, you know, as I was talking about earlier, it's a learned skill, you know, like, like anything you do, it just becomes much, much easier over time. And I think you know people who've been meditating for a long time would know this that you can you can get into the zone very quickly when you've been doing it for years. First few times might not be quite so easy. Yeah, that's absolutely uh, been the case for myself. Uh, do you get the sense that the the guides that you work <laughs> with have all been through the cycle of reincarnation as humans, or are some of them just coming from this? another plane of reality or an angelic realm that didn't include passing through the human experience? All, all, all the spirit guides that I work with have been through all their, their lives. I mean, to be a causal plane spirit guide, you have to have completed life on a physical plane. It could be, you know, a hundred and something lifetimes. And then going to the, the astral plane, you work as a spirit guide there. Um, that's where, you know, if you've got, if your grandmother's work, uh, working with you, your deceased aunt or whatever, um, they, they'd be working with you from the, from the astral plane. Once you're complete, once you've done or learned everything you need to learn about that, then you and your soul family, this group of souls that you came into the world with at the same time, will basically just move up uh, to the causal plane as a group. Um, you still have some sense of identity individual identity partly, but you're, you're working very much as a group. And, uh, and so, yes, I mean, that's what I think, um, you know, people often ask me about how the spirit world feels about suicide or whatever. And, I, and the answer is that the, the spirit world is endlessly compassionate, that, you know, you hear these myths about, oh, you know, if you, if you take your own life, you have to come back and go through the same stuff. And, you know, it's a, you know, it's a sin, it's the wrong thing to do. My experience has been that the spirit world is very, very compassionate because they've been here. They know how hard it can be. And sometimes life is just overwhelming. So, the, you know, it's just nothing but love that, you know, I get from the other side. Not in a kind of um, airy-fairy kind of, you know, love and light, blathery sort of way. But, you know, that this is what we're ultimately learning. You know, what's the point of being on earth and all these experiences that we have it's to take us to that place of where we really understand the power of love. It's interesting. A couple different schools of thought or teachings come to mind, and that is, and I'm not that familiar with secular religion per se, but it reminds me in, in the sense of the soul family and being able to rejoin is like that interpretation of heaven, right? After you leave the body, <laughs> you're, you know, you're with your parents and your grandparents and your, your loved ones again, on the other side, uh, I, I guess we, in traditional religions, there would be the caveat, <laughs> if you've not sinned too much, you know, that's where you're going, mm -hmm. uh, going in the other direction, um, which as a kid, you know, I always thought sounded like a fairy tale. Now, I think more from a perspective of your 
karmic inheritance and the result of your actions here on this plane would probably indicate kind of what direction um, you're going. Do you have a sense that yeah. if you really screw this up, that there's somewhere else that your soul could exist on another plane that is less desirable? Or is is the universe that forgiving and God that forgiving that no matter how horrendous our behavior was here, that we're going to be, you know, reunited with our loved ones per se and our spirit guides and have another shot at coming back until we're less of a jerk. <laughs> well, I think it's it's all of that. Um, certainly, you know, if you talk to people uh, who, who work in hospice, work with the, 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 you know, helping people over to the other side, you know, they often have stories about, um, well, in fact, I put in one of my books about how my, uh, my uh, great-grandmother, um, when she was passing, you know, a few days or weeks before she was in a, a coma, in and out of a coma. And every, every so often she would come to and she would count out the people she could see at the end of her bed, these, these spirits. She would say, oh, there's Uncle Fred, there's Aunt Maisie, and there's so-and-so. Um, it was only uh, after, after I published that story that uh, I checked it out with my mother. I said, you know, do you remember that um, story about your grandmother? And she, she reminded me of the one bit I wish I had I'd known at the time to put in the book, but what I thought was so funny was that she would, she would wake up Look at all these people, count them out, and they're so and so. I mean, there could be like a dozen of them, and she's coming around like that. Then she catches a glimpse of herself in, in a mirror and goes, Oh, geez, is that bloody woman still here? <laughs> it's like the weirdest thing. So, at least that's it, you know, it's, it's a way to comfort you to, when you go to the other side to be met by spirits who would present themselves in a form that would be familiar to you. So you'd feel, Oh, it's my mom or, or, whatever that would be it's you know that sort of thing is very comforting and spirits can present themselves in a way that you know that would be appealing to you so like my uncle john came he looked exactly like my uncle john he was actually more real than even my memory um but he did say to me after we worked for a few hours he's uh he's pointed out that john was just one of many many lifetimes and he has no more no greater attachment to that one life than to a lot of the others um, so the, the, I wanted to, there was something you touched on there about, you know, what happens when we um, process on the, the astral plane. So we've, if we be, behave really badly on the physical plane, um, we, there, there's karma. There's, it's, and karma is not punishment. I always stress that. It's about a, a balancing of experience. So what you will do, um, part of this whole processing that we do it, uh, when we come to the end of this life is to help us be aware of the impact of our behavior on other people. So we actually emotionally uh, pick up on what we've kind of inflicted on others. And it can be stuff we would have no conscious recollection of. It could be how you hurt a uh, five-year-old child back when you were a kid by not inviting them to your birthday party and you could feel the the hurt from that person it just all of it helps you to be it helps your soul to be aware of the the impact of your behavior on others and of course that then leads to you your soul goes okay we'll make sure we don't do that it, it all helps to build uh the lessons that take you to where you embody the the higher core values um the the paths or excuse me i've got a, I've got a cat <laughs> hey talking of soulmates this is my That's... <laughs> little feline companion lily so we 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 process them and it's an essential thing because you can't ever tell people say to me you know have i learned everything i need to learn we yeah possibly but you won't know until you go to the astral plane because you can't see it from that perspective. You can't see how you, it affected other people. So if your soul goes, well, you know, we murdered scores of people, um, you know, we, we behaved really badly, it will say, well, we need to, to balance the karma. And it's not like, you know, I killed, so therefore you need to kill me. Um, it's, it's more like I, I killed, I behaved badly. I didn't act according to my soul's direction because no soul will ever want to take another soul's life. 
And so then it will say, okay, well, the next life, we'll, we'll do some humanitarian work or really um, you know, try to do something that really... Uh, <laughs> I, think that's, I love you too, sweetie. I think that's the first cat we've ever had on the show. My <laughs> cast a lot, but this is the first feline. It's really sweet. Yeah, that's about that, eh? <laughs> so uh, I hope that's... Uh, uh, no, it's, it's, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, it's it's just fascinating. Um, I, I get the sense that, and, and you've talked about this in, in, in um, to some degree, and I kind of wanted to get an update on this, but I get the sense that throughout my life, certain people that I have this intrinsic bond to that's just undeniably deep and profound and so obvious to me. Uh, even if it's a relatively new relationship, mm-hmm. um, and this would be true with my parents and and friends and and lovers that I've had in my life, et cetera, mm-hmm. where it's that sense of a soul family connection, yeah, and that you know we travel through these lifetimes as as one long lifetime where each each minute lifetime as a as a person of a various name, gender, et cetera. Uh, it's like there's these punctuation marks in one long life. And it's as if we're traveling together on this vessel of consciousness in and out of these earthly experiences. And and we reunite for a few years and then we depart. And then in other lifetimes, we come back together for a period. And I get the sense that it's it's almost as if our spirits or souls were birthed around the same time. And we've set sail into these incarnations right. together and we kind of, you know, go apart and then reconvene and then go apart and reconvene. And I would hope ultimately once we've learned whatever there was to learn that we again reconvene uh, in those higher planes. Would that fit into, into your paradigm? And what Totally, you- totally my understanding. Uh, so we come into the world with a soul family. And this is, you know, thousands of souls basically coming into the world around the same time. Um, so maybe in the space of a, a generation. For, um, for someone who's uh, an old soul now, that might have been five, six, seven thousand years ago. It's quite a long journey, you know, back and forth um, between here and the astral plane. Um, it's like a horse race. You, you know, you all come here at the same time. Um, different parts of the world, and then you're off and running, and and you you geez, I've got cat hairs everywhere. <laughs> um, so you you you're you're spread out, and often learning your your different lessons, getting all your experiences, and it's, it's what your soul's here to do is to to grow and evolve. As you get to be an old soul, which is roughly halfway through these many lifetimes it becomes much more important to share the experiences with members of your soul family, old friends. Old friends are soulmates, essentially, who, uh, souls that, you've, that are part of the soul family, but that you've known before. You've, you've had some experience with them on the physical plane. So the, this, there's a couple of reasons that souls, the old souls will want to keep reuniting with members of the soul family is that it's actually you get a sense of comfort and familiarity from somebody you've known before. Or, or even if you haven't met them on the physical plane, but at least you have that soul connection because they're part of the, this larger soul family. So it makes it easier to go to a deeper emotional place with somebody, for, especially for an old soul, than trying to get something going from scratch. I think I've often said that I think we would value our friendships and relationships more if we knew how much work goes on on the other side, on the on the um, causal plane, particularly to make sure that we meet, um, because the, the the spirit guides can be working with you just to to make sure you maybe maybe there's a party and you're somebody you, there's a soul that you're meant to meet there, and you might go, "Geez, I'm tired. I think I'll just you know." a loaf on the sofa tonight, but there's that little part of you that goes, no, I think I really am meant to go, or you pay attention, there's something there that you're getting, that, you know, and you drag yourself out of the house, you know, what am I doing? And then you get there, and you have a great time, and you meet somebody, and maybe it's a, you know, a relationship you were looking for or something, but the, the spirit world is trying to get us all to meet all the time. They've actually described this to me as the great game. 
I said to the spirit guides, but I'm not uh, bothering you and as- asking questions for a client. What are you doing? What do you do all day? <laughs> they said, well, actually, we're really busy making sure that you people on the, on the physical plane interact and meet each other and learn from the experiences and help us to process things as, as we go along. So there's a lot of work is a short of it. And we, and we are meant to continually develop relationships with those that we've known before. Often there's karma as well. So you may be working through something. Um, I just literally, like an hour ago, I was working with somebody who's, um, she was her mom's mom in a past life. And they're working through some challenging stuff, let's say, in this life because of that. The mom's actually come into this life with a little bit of resentment towards the, the, this, this poor woman who's, uh, because she feels in the past life that her mom wasn't totally there for her. And uh, so coming to work through some things together, sometimes it works better than other times. You know, and when there's karma, you know that feeling of, you know, I love you, but I can't live with you or you know, um, push and pull that you often get with people. You know, they, they drive you nuts, but you can't imagine life without them. That's often because there's stuff that you're working through from a past life and you get the memories of traumatic events and maybe mistreatment from, you know, one to the other. Uh, it's, it's fascinating when you go into it because as an old soul, there are probably a lot more um, people that you've met on the journey that you are connected to than you would imagine. That so much, so many of the people that you connect with uh, are, are those that you are meant to. And there's something there for you. And like I say, if I think if we knew about this or were aware, we would value these connections. We'd probably meet somebody and say, well, is there something more here? But you certainly know that familiarity, right? Where you meet somebody and you go, oh, where do I know you from? Yeah, I've really paid attention to that sense uh, in the in the past few years as I've become more oriented toward following my intuition mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, paying attention to those subtle cues. You know, perhaps I should go to that event or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be. And it's um, becoming increasingly <clears throat> common that over some time as a relationship has developed, especially this would absolutely be true of my um, lovely girlfriend, Allison, uh, just following those little hints, those breadcrumbs of going, hmm, there's something here that I'm supposed to pay attention to. And then, yeah. you know, follow those cues. And then this amazing, you know, beautiful relationship unfolds of whatever nature. And that sure. that kind of will instigate me to ah, pay attention next time you get that cue. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We're meant to learn from that. Right. It, it, and it is, it's a fun skill to start to uh, identify and to cultivate. I'm yeah. curious um, with your interaction with the guides or just in your worldview in general, if you get the sense that, well, there's kind of two questions. One is, and and I've heard this from various teachings that when you incarnate here as a as a human and you're born, that the moment that you're going to leave your body is already predetermined and that the how the where is just kind of like how the movie ends, but we all have kind of an expiration date here. And no matter what you do, uh, ultimately, you know, you're going to be 85 years old and you're going to pass away in a hospital or you're going to be 85 somewhere else in the world and get hit by a bus, whatever the case may be, that we each kind of have a date that we're going to check out. Have you explored that phenomenon at all? It's not something that um, I was able to get my spirit guides to validate. Um, they, they, their take on it is that they, they never really want to go there with, with anybody. The only time that they've ever told me that somebody, it was somebody who's seriously ill and, uh, the spirit guy said that person's got about a year and sure enough, it was, it was like a year to the week almost. Um, but usually what they'll say to me is we don't know. We really don't know. Um, we can't tell. The only thing is that, um, I I have heard that it's it's not so much that you it's carved in stone, but if you think of it as like your life's journey on a train. Now I'm not saying this is not this is not um, uh, you know verified by my spirit guides, but this is just something that I've heard. It seemed to make sense that if you think of it, it's like a you're, you're on a train and there's stops 
you know, every so often there's little stations. Now you can you can get off at the stations that you can exit this life. You know, you can get off the train and that's it. Over. Um, if you don't get off at that point, then you're not you're not going to leave the the train. You're not going to leave this life until you get to the next station. So it's at specific points. I, I mean, I certainly hear people talk about how through Chinese astrology you can get a sense of when you're going to pass and so on. Like I say, it's just not something that uh, my spirit guys want to go there. They, they wouldn't want, I mean, I've certainly had it with people going, well, when am I going to die? Or when's, when am I going to die? Or whatever. Oh, they just don't want to go there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, have you ever looked into this uh, particular element of our experience? And that is, is there any indication when the human spirit actually enters the embryo or fetus? Yes. In some spiritual teachings, it's indicated, I would say, based on my experience and research, more often than not at around 90 days or three months, when you, in fact, drop into your mother's womb and take that form. Have you found anything in that, uh, in that realm? Yes, well, what I get from the, the spirit guides is that really the soul, although the soul is selected, you can often tell. I mean, I can, I can, I've, I've seen people who have even selected there's an agreement you, you when you come in as a as a baby you choose your family and they choose you it's a, it's by soul agreement so i've seen it with even two years before birth the soul has already um agreed to come in you it's like you know who you're getting that, that way i can sort of i could work with somebody and say well you know this child it's a long time off but you know that child's gonna have issues with separation anxiety from rejection in a past life i'll be aware of this um and so uh, the actual soul, it, my understanding is that it, it comes in right at the time of birth. And when, when my first child was born, um, <clears throat> literally at the moment that the head appeared, I had a sort of out-of-body experience. And I'm going, wow, that was really weird. And later I would say to the spirit guide, so what was that all about? And they said, well, um, it was just the moment the soul came in and you were feeling that sort of energy. It was a little bit uh, ooh, suddenly on another plane. Um, so that's my understanding. So of course the soul can be selected. There wouldn't be an awful lot for the soul to do in utero. You know, it's like, I mean, <laughs> a little, it's boring enough for, for a soul sometimes. Oh, this is something I come across a lot. You know, the, the old soul coming into the, you know, to be a baby again, seems like a great idea on the astral plane. When you get here, it's like, the soul, is, you know, I, I always get this picture of the soul kind of becoming aware it's a baby again and going, oh, geez, you know, what, what, God, I've got to go through this again. And particularly if they're very, um, like if, if in their soul times, because your personality is all chosen before you come here. So if that's a, a, a leader type, that's the kind of kid, I, I mean, I come across this all the time with clients where they have that leader child you imagine somebody who comes in as a baby, but they were a general in a past life or they ran a corporation or something, all those leadership skills, and they're having to be told what to do. That is really tough for a soul. And uh, you often get that sort of little soul being very resistant to being told what to do, especially if there's any past life of imprisonment or enslavement, because then if you try to control that child, uh, it's like... Um, I was working with, I put this in, the, in one of my books, I was working with somebody and she was a very challenging teenage daughter. And I, um, I said, I bet you saw signs of this when, the, when she was really little. And she said, oh yeah, so five years old and we're having this argument. And this little five-year-old ended the argument by saying to the mother, you can't tell me what to do. I used to be your mom. <laughs> you know, it's like end of conversation. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I do find that um, it's, it's something to do with the, the work that I do, but people do share things, you know, that they, they often say, well, I wouldn't tell anyone else this, but, you know, I, and a, a lot of times I hear about, they'll talk about little things that their kids say that are related to past lives. They'll say, well, when I was in my big body or, you know, when last time when I was the mom, you know, this happened and so on. So uh, there's that little window when, you know, when babies or, you know, or children are, are just able to communicate. And before this kind of veil comes down, 
you know, just that narrow little window and you want, they'll often share little things that are past life related. I will say, if you have a child who does that, encourage them. Ask them, be curious. See what the, it reveals. I've not heard that before, but I find that really interesting because in that first few formative years of your childhood, as your individual ego personality identity is taking form uh, and you're in that primary theta state most of the time where you're you're getting imprinted essentially by your environment to form whatever said personality is going to develop into um, kids often do exist in that dream world with the imaginary mm-hmm. friends and right so there's this very uh you know kind of fantasy element to early childhood yeah. and uh i think it's often sad when the adults aren't <laughs> into that level oh level. yes yeah and stifle that experience and, you know, say, hey, grow up, you know, get in the real world. And it's like, no, that's such a precious time when you're able to kind of exist in both planes. And it seems young children often have the ability to do that. So that would explain yeah. a lot as to why that phenomenon takes place. Absolutely. That's why. Yeah. It's uh, it's interesting to me in in terms of the multiple incarnations that you know, most of us come in and unless we've done a lot of meditating or we've been someone like you that's accessed spirit guides or done plant medicines or psychedelics or something that's really allowed us in a profound way to access other dimensions of consciousness, that it's almost as if mm, creation has designed us to come into each lifetime with amnesia. Yeah. And it, I, <clears throat> that it might be psychologically too much for us to take in each individual lifetime, as I said, kind of each punctuation point in that one long lifetime, because it's just too much to hold intellectually and too much to contextualize at once. Do you think that we're experiencing this forgetfulness of who we are and where we came from in order to have a new experience each time and to glean whatever lessons can be gleaned from that individual kind of newly shaped personality that we take on each time and, and obviously the experience is inherent to that lifetime? Right. Well, I think that's, <clears throat> it's, I think it's all of that. Um, we choose our personality. That's, that's something we, we come into the world with. That's why I say, you know, when, if people say babies are born as blank slates, I will say, well, you've never seen one, have you? Because, the, you know, if you've had a baby, or have, especially when you can compare more than one, you, you'll see they're very, very different. I mean, I have two kids and I mean, one's an extreme introvert, one's an extreme extrovert, you know, they're very, very different. But all of that, I read them when they were an hour old. So um, just almost the moment they were born, I was seeing all, you know, what they would sort of grow into. Um, but of course, that's shaped by the environment and the upbringing as well. So we, but so certainly the core of the personality is chosen, but it can be part of what we're all doing is casting off the influences of our parents, teachers, the environment uh, that we're raised in, um, the culture itself, to really find um, who we are. You know, it's a lifelong journey for a lot of people to really go back and find out who they were. The, the amnesia is protective because it, tr- past life trauma can be so devastating for something to in a past life to show up as a fear, phobia, limiting belief, or some kind of even physical block in this life. It has to have been enough in that past life to take you off your life plan. If it doesn't rise to that level, it won't show up in, in future lives, or not very strongly anyway. Um, so the amnesia is partly because if you think about how awful it was, you know, in the past life where you were, you were, uh, raped in a prison, accused of sorcery, dragged through the streets, humiliated and burned at the stake. I mean, that's pretty horrific as, as one life. But imagine you start compounding that with vivid memories of every single life that you had, all the grief, the heartache, the sadness. So many of us, I mean, or really every old soul has known what it's like to lose children, for example, childhood diseases and so on. Um, if you were really conscious of all of those, you, you would have a problem. I mean, it, you wouldn't be able to function. It really would be debilitating. But people say, I don't remember my past lives. And I actually argue that we do. We just don't know what we're looking for because we're expecting it to be like, a, you know, having that movie in our hand, you know, and all, all the details. But we remember our past lives through our behavior, through our quirks, through 
uh, those little idiosyncrasies that make us who we are. Why, you know, one person has a fear of elevators and another doesn't. Well, I mean, that fear of elevators is from enclosed spaces or a dungeon in a past life. Um, one person has a fear of public speaking, that's judgments and execution in a past life. So we're actually holding all these memories. We just don't always know what to look for. Yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, I can imagine it would be quite torturous to be able to hold in mind all of those past traumas, you yeah. know, enough to deal with the traumas that we experience along the way in each lifetime that we're currently. Well, right. In. Well, you know how bad it is. this life can have been. You know, imagine that's compounded by you know 120 life. I mean, so that would be a lot of a lot of emotions to be dragging around with you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've had experiences or it sounds like perhaps it's not necessary for you because you're tapped in on the natural, but uh, I, I, a lot of this brings to mind experiences I've had in the past couple of years with um, psychedelics and plant medicines where, um, you know, you become interdimensional and right. are being able to access other planes of reality beyond just this physical experience and even beyond the intellect and your emotions and this lifetime. And tapping into kind of that one long chapter. And um, in a couple of those experiences, I've had one in particular, a very visceral series of memories and viewpoints Mm -hmm. into uh, past lives in India. And I've always wondered why, uh, even since I was a little kid, I was always fascinated with Hindu and Indian culture and the music and the teachings. And I've always gravitated toward, you know, the various forms of yoga and all the meditations and the gurus and teachers and teachings coming out of that part of the world uh, to the point where I, I think that was one of my first international solo trips in my early thirties. I just had to go there. Yeah. Uh, and I had an experience fairly recently where I uh, took, I took part in a ceremony with five MEO DMT uh, the Bufo Alvarius toad in which you smoke the venom of said toad. Right. And <laughs> all, pre- I mean, it's, it's be, anyone that's done it knows that you to describe it is to discredit it because, or right. put a disservice because it's so profound and it's ineffable really. But during this experience, um, after the initial kind of disintegration of all reality, ego, mind, self, personality, I was taken through these visions of, um, it, it's still so tangible yeah. uh-huh. experience, but it, it wasn't like I could see myself in a mirror or see myself walking around or, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a subjective personal experience. It was more like an awareness of being on the Ganges and having my body be burned. And it was, it was very vague and nebulous, but the the kind of message behind it for me now in this incarnation was (laughs) totally unplanned. um, Unplanned reenactment, but it was, it's like I was given this sense of all of the spiritual work that I'd done in that part of the world through so many lifetimes. And it was like, It was like my spirit or higher self was kind of patting me on the back this time. Yeah. Well, what I love is that because when I'm working with somebody, sometimes even before I'll tell them about a past life, they'll they'll just start sobbing and go, I don't know where this is coming from. Well, time's fluid on the other side, and sometimes they'll be experiencing the, the emotions coming up from a past life before we even talk about it um what do you know when you're describing something as profound as that uh you think of how much learning there is you know being able to tap into your past lives in india and by the way when you when you have a past life in a place as a really old soul if you've been there once you've probably been there multiple times and certainly you know when you get that feeling of like real connection like with a place like india yeah It's familiar. You go there. It feels just like home. You you even get that feeling of being here before. Um, And that uh, that actually moves 
old souls around the globe quite a lot, sort of seeking out sometimes the comfort that they had from being in a place, um, but certainly from understanding. Um, the, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of ways to tap into the other side. Now, I did it, you know, just to, through my uncle and working with spirit guides. Um, you know, but there's, you know, we're all different, you know, and they're, they're all, it's what they say, there's all different rivers that lead to the ocean, but they all get you to the ocean in the end. Um, and microdosing is something, that, you know, people are becoming much more aware of. Uh, I have a lot of clients who've done ayahuasca ceremonies and so on, and and really sort of opening up to, to the other side. These are all valid ways of doing it. And, uh, but it's always about, you know, why, why do we do that? What, 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 what are we hoping to get from it? And for an awful lot of us, I think it's like a feeling of wanting to be connected, feeling connected to our past lives, to other souls, to the universe, to the collective consciousness, to the universal consciousness. It's a, it's a big search because we're not meant to be, we humans are not meant to be anywhere like as isolated as we are. That's a kind of, it's almost like the fault of the system or the modern world that we so many of us live in. If you go back to how things were in a tribe, we, uh, one of the things the spirit guides will talk about is that everybody had a purpose and we were very aware of how we needed each other. We were very much more supportive uh, of one another because we, we recognized that the whole thing is a system that, that we're part of. And so we've kind of lost that along the way, you know, in, in this sort of more dog-eat-dog kind of world um, in, in you know, forgetting that we, you know, none of us is really a rugged individualist. We're, we all are, are dependent on the other people and we're all here to support each other a lot more. Back in the tribe, if you lost a partner, say, then you would be comforted, you, would, you know, you would uh, be, be welcomed in uh, the very much more sort of touchy-feely than we'd probably be comfortable with in this world, but all helping to you to overcome the, the effects of the, the loss. And unfortunately, so many people here are, are walking about with past life wounds, present life wounds, and, and not knowing what to do with it. So one of the things about feeling connected to something older, uh, more ancient and deeper is that it, it, it's, it opens up everything. Um, the more you can, even learning about the world, like learning about far off places. And even looking at old photographs can help to tap people into past lives and get that greater feeling of connection to part of this bigger thing and also help to explain um, behavior. I actually looked up a couple of your past lives. Would you like, would you be interested in? Fascinated, absolutely, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to bring some notes up here. So you're a pretty old soul, by the way. Um, Technically speaking, you were 40% into level 10, which, uh, as I like to say, should qualify you for free bus travel, <laughs> at the very least, but being very much a senior citizen. Um, actually, part of what you're, you're, you're here to do, very broadly speaking, and not in, a, not in any kind of conventional way, but it's to teach, um, but it's more like imparting knowledge Giving, helping people to have access to knowledge. Um, there's, uh, in, in terms of your personality, I mean, you certainly have that very spiritual side. This is literally what they call a spiritualist type, this element in your, your personality. Um, also, deep sensitivity from uh, what's called the, the creator in your, you have many, many lives as a creative person, um, artist, musician, whatever. And you also have leadership um, showing up here very strongly. You've been a leader in, in many lifetimes. And that's actually kind of part of what you're doing. I have noticed that one thing seems to unite uh, people who have, who have podcasts like this is that they're all trying to bring the tribe together. It's like putting the band back together or like, you know, keeping the family Drawing, drawing everybody in, but it's really sort of trying to find the soul family. And it's a spiritual act. And a spiritual act is anything you do that um, helps other people and heals you at the same time. Essentially, you, you heal yourself by helping those who suffer as you once did. So a lot of the, a lot of the old souls that you'll be drawing into your world 
will be ones who are really looking for belonging and connection with other old souls as well. And also to be able to explore topics that are a little bit out of the ordinary, that don't really speak to younger souls. You know, like young, young souls don't really, they're not much interested in having conversations about spirit guides, but older souls will feel terms like that at least are familiar. Um, even if it doesn't matter what you call them, but I mean, it could be angels or whatever, but you know, there's a sense that, oh yeah, these are my people. So that's what you're doing. It's almost like a Pied Piper drawing, drawing the tribe in. I want to tell you about a, uh, two past lives that are playing into this life. Um, the first one that I got was um, in the Caribbean somewhere. So, uh, I, I don't know, Jamaica or somewhere. Uh, you were a boy. Your mother abandoned you. She was actually, she was mentally ill. She had a kind of religious mania. And uh, she beat you to remove bad spirits or something like that. And uh, you were actually taken away from, from her and went to live with your grandmother. Uh, it's for your own safety. Um, you became a preacher, um, and they were talking. The guys were talking about how you learned to to write. Uh, you were you're a big writer, uh, but it was very much about communication, whether it was written or verbal. Partly, you know, having that opportunity to get practice of being on, you know, in front of an audience. They did say that you found the religious perspective um, being sort of tied to the the Bible, so where it was very limiting. And that actually is one of the reasons why now uh, a big part of what you're doing is, you you know, in presenting information to other people, you're seeking the truth. You're trying to find what really is the, the truth. And you you have to, um, this is actually part of your life plan, you have to cast your net quite wide and then pull it in and then just take what, what you need. Um, so it's almost like being an explorer, having to, dabble here get interested in that read about that and then to find uh, you know to, to then get rid of the stuff that doesn't really speak to you it's uh, uh and then just keeping the, the the those little gems that you find uh in amongst everything so endless curiosity coming from that past life because you did feel a little bit like yeah you didn't really get the sort of growth that that you wanted also being with uh somebody being raised particularly by somebody with uh uh, mental illness and violence and so on. Uh, the the two big lessons for you from that life, and they'll be carried into this life, are resilience. It's kind of like learning to uh, roll with the punches, possibly quite literally in that past life, and also to learn compassion for others. You know, compassion for somebody who is mentally ill, um, and that's all. Um, the resilience, compassion, and the truth, you know, being, being a seeker, uh, that's, those are the sort of main things that you've taken uh, from the past life and brought into the present. Now, the other past life that I looked at was in England. You were a woman trapped in a loveless marriage. Uh, a number of big past life fears came up from that. Uh, one is rejection. It was from the feeling of being unloved. And in this life, uh, usually somebody with a past life issue around rejection would feel, especially as an old soul, where your, your values and views are not mainstream, you can easily feel a little bit like an outsider or like you don't fully fit in. And again, that could be why you're wanting to draw the, the tribe in. It's really, you're helping them, but you're feeling like you belong at the same time. The other thing is that you were trapped in a, a loveless marriage. And, and being trapped uh, is it's, it's the equivalent of being in prison for decades. Uh, and anyone who's been imprisoned or enslaved in a past life will have, will, they'll carry a past life fear into the present. It's a fear of powerlessness. And it comes from being, from having all your power taken away from you and not having any say over your destiny. And that was very much a part of what happened to you there. You went into that victim place, couldn't find a way out of it. Maybe it was against your religious beliefs to get divorced or something, but you were stuck in a place that you shouldn't have been for uh, really all your life. And that's, that sort of thing is very significant because the karmically speaking, 
when you're working through powerlessness, you are meant to be an empowered person. That's a big part of what your, your, your journey is about. Learning to be uh, empowered, but also to empower other people. It's like, uh, I always describe this as being the difference between teaching somebody to fish rather than just giving them a fish. I mean, sure, you want to help people, but you want to empower them and help them to be able to do things for themselves. I think even with, the, with what we're doing right now, I mean, part of your, your motivation is really, it's what can people take from us? What can they learn? How can they use this, this information? Because that's kind of how you're put together. Uh, let me just scan my notes. I just want to see if there's anything else. Um, no, those are the main things. But uh, w- w- let me just talk about this. If you are... If you've been trapped in a situation that to some extent is of your own making, because however trapped you were or how much you felt that way, it's really the, the prisoner in you from, from that past life experience that feels, I can't see my options. I'm stuck in this situation. In this life, what, it becomes, what becomes very important is not, um, not sticking around in a situation that's not working whether it's a relationship, work, whatever, the, the message you'll be getting from the spirit world is life's too short. Get the hell out. Uh, that doesn't mean sort of bail out at the first sign of trouble. It means that you're not meant to be, there's no lesson, there's no growth from you in being a victim or being, you know, you know mistreated or, or whatever. And it's the, the growth really comes I mean, remember that resilience thing. It's from saying, okay, I need to protect myself and maybe I need to sort of get out of this situation. Also, and it's worth mentioning too, your soul has a pretty low boredom threshold. So if things, if you're doing anything that's repetitive for too long, your soul's just going to start going nuts and going, Jesus, we need to get, you know, like the worst thing for you would be to go into a nine to five job every day that you didn't particularly enjoy. Same old, same old. Your soul would just be like, oh, get me out of here. You know, it's like that would be, that would be sort of like the worst thing because it would be essentially a repetition being trapped again. So this fear of being trapped will, will give you, well, there's a number of things. I'm sorry to go on, but I, I, I love my work, as you can probably tell. But um, freedom, personal freedom is absolutely paramount. It might be one of the most important things that you're learning from this life is that, because I'm sure you recognize the don't, don't fence me in kind of feeling. And I'm sure you've, if you haven't said it frequently in this life, you probably thought it a lot, um, the phrase, don't tell me what to do. Because if, if, if somebody tries to control you, telling you what to do rather than maybe suggesting or asking you, your soul will be taken back to the place where you had no say over your destiny. And, and it does not like that at all. Tell me if any of that doesn't make sense. All of that is 1000% spot on, microscopically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in fact, um, I mean, there's so many parts I could unpack there and I, you know, I don't want to be too self-serving on, on my own podcast, but um, hopefully other people can derive benefit from it. But it's really interesting. A couple of points there that really ring out and that is the that fear of uh, entrapment. Oh, yeah. You know? and, and that's manifested in a number of ways. Um, one being, um, quite unfortunately, I guess you could say, is that for most of my adult life, I've had this prohibitive fear of intimacy and being kind of locked into a relationship so that in my 20s and 30s and even into my early 40s, it was very difficult for me to just settle down and... yeah. And enjoy a level of, of true closeness and intimacy with a partner. Um, thankfully, I've completely recovered from that um, according Good. to an awareness. And I'm, you know, as I said, in just an absolutely amazing relationship and I'm not afraid at all. Like I want, all I want is just further intimacy and more closeness and more bonding mm-hmm. and more connectedness. So uh, I think it's really been healed through all of the work that I've done and and finally being aligned with a partner who is a safe person to do that with. Right. Well, that's really important. When you're working through issues around intimacy and trust from a past life, uh, you have to, uh, if, if you're with somebody that you don't fully trust, 
and it may not be something you're consciously aware of. It could be on a, on a deep soul level, you pick up something like you don't totally feel like you can, you can completely open up to them. That can be a problem. You end up um, with that fear of being trapped. It's like having one foot in, maybe just a couple of toes in, and the rest are kind of out. Um, you often find people with these fears around intimacy and rejection will choose uh, geographically or emotionally unavailable partners. And then they have an out. You know, when it doesn't work out or like after five years, they go, oh, I can't stand this person. It's like they, they had set it up from the beginning. And of course, that, that's the problem. You end up with lots of short relationships. The most important thing is, I always say, when you're overcoming these issues around trust, is to be with somebody who you can, you can reveal your innermost secrets, truth, and not have a fear that they're going to throw it back in your face or use it in an argument or tell somebody else. It's being able to have pillow talk safely. And once you find that person, then it's two feet in. Your soul goes, okay, now we're not going to feel trapped because, you know, we're not worried that this is not going to work out. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. Yo, I am super pumped to share with you beekeepersnaturals.com. Now, if you heard episode 175 with founder and CEO Carly Stein, you know exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are the highest quality bee products in the world from Beekeepers Naturals. Now, I've been using bee products for a long time. Back in the 90s, I was rocking like the bee pollen and And, you know, using kind of gourmet honey over the years and things like that. But until that interview, honestly, I had no idea of the superpowers and the variety of different bee products. So not only do these guys make the cleanest, most organic, most potent bee products, they also have the widest variety of products. So whether it's propolis, which helps you with the immune system, um, soothing scratchy throats, it's really potent stuff, or the bee pollen, which is a superfood with vitamins and nutrients and gives you energy. It has amino acids and protein, whether it's the raw honey, the royal jelly. Uh, They even have a tonic for your brain. I mean, they have a lot of great products over there. So if you're not hip to the power of bee products as a superfood, I want to highly recommend that you get over to beekeepersnaturals.com. And honestly, if you want to just learn all about bees in the industry and how it's done and how it's done right for ecology and for the environment, definitely go back and listen to episode 175. It's a, it's a great episode and the founder Carly is just brilliant and she's running a really great operation over there. So I'm very happy to support them on the show. And uh, like all the stuff I always talk about, I use them every day. In fact, I use it too much because I run out of it. Like when I interviewed her, I was like, so I do like a couple tablespoons of the bee powered, which is the really potent one that combines all of the superfoods in the hive into one product. She's like, dude, the dose for that is half a teaspoon once a day. You're tripping. But, you know, I'm hardcore Uh, because it just tastes delicious and it gives you like instant energy. So definitely get over to beekeepersnaturals.com. When you're there, if you enter the code LIFESTYLIST, that's one word, LIFESTYLIST, you'll save 15% off your order. So go to beekeepersnaturals.com, enter the code LIFESTYLIST. And now back to the interview. You're absolutely right. And I'm so thankful, um, deeply thankful that I have found someone like that. You know, and it's funny thinking about that, the value of freedom, you know, which is something that you... Uh, alluded to so accurately throughout my life. I mean, I think my number one value over anything for much of my life was freedom. Yeah. Mm. I need to do what I want when I want to do it and do my best not to step on toes along the way, but I'm, I'm going on my way. And, um, and it, you know, at times it's served me and at times it hasn't, but something I realized maybe three years ago or so, uh, was, in terms of interpersonal relationships and specifically romantic relationships, that that fear that we discussed of a perceived loss of freedom and not wanting to be tied down and get married or have kids or even be monogamous at some point in my journey, um, that I I had a really shallow shallow interpretation of what freedom was and what I... (laughs) Right, yeah. And so what I've found is I've really uncovered this deeper level of freedom, which is true freedom of soul to express itself without reservation and to express love unabashedly without reservation and to receive it, you know, and that's, 
indicative of what you just explained is that, you know, that pillow talk example you gave where you're able to just be fully transparent and fully vulnerable and available to another person. And I'm finding uh, over time that in that is the true freedom. There was almost this decoy freedom or facsimile of freedom that I was so adamantly, you know, clinging to when in fact it was really a self-imposed prison based on fear and insecurity, not wanting to be heard or be abandoned. And so my my shallow interpretation of uh, freedom kind of kept me locked out of the the true freedom of spirit and soul where I'm able to to truly be intimate and feel completely safe and seen and held by another person, which is... Right. It's almost like I look back now and just laugh like, oh my God, I used to think I was free. I was in my own self-imposed prison of fear. That's it. That's you know, what I'm saying. To you, um, it's like you, you lose the ability to see all your options when you've been imprisoned in a past life. And uh, one, one thing you're touching on there is that you're looking to really uh, be able to open your heart chakra. Every soul uh, is, is looking for that, you know, to be able to be in that real loving place. It's only the fears that get in the way of that. And if you're in a relationship where you're continually triggered, you can never open up the heart chakra. That, you know, if if there's reasons to be kind of concerned about the relationship, it's not really what you want. Well, it's very hard to really feel, yes, you know, here here I am, wide open. Um, You have to really have a, a strong level of safety, feeling of safety to be able to do that. And people have said to me, they, they, you know, they've asked, well, you know, I feel like if I open my heart chakra, I'm going to be really vulnerable. And the answer is, yeah. But that's how you really, you know, I mean, you can live a half-assed life and never really open your heart chakra, or you can really go for it um, and and really know what it is to to love and experience that, you know, very, very deep intimacy. But we... You know, another thing you're touching on, we have patterns all the time, and they're based on past lives as well. Like, you know, anytime you can say, well, I always seem to, you know, and then fill in the blanks, you know, I always seem to meet people who are unavailable. I always seem to, you know, whatever it is, um, followed by something that's not so great. Uh, That's a sign you're working through something. And, you know, a lot of times we get into repeat patterns because we're not learning from from the experiences that we have. Something my spirit guide said, and I think it's one of the most profound things I've ever heard them say, is that the experience is not the lesson. The lesson is what you draw from the experience. And there's always a positive lesson, no matter how hard the experience. So even if you, and I've tested my spirit guides, I go, so what if you're being tortured in a secret prison? And they'll go, well, it teaches you about the importance of of higher volumes and treating somebody well, you know, it's always something that can be drawn from the experience. And unfortunately, we get into patterns and we, unless we're really sort of processing those and really kind of, you know, actively trying to learn as we go along, it's so easy just to find, you know, we're, we're, we're bumping into things at random, you know, it's like we're like a ship that's just sort of, you know, out on the ocean just hoping to find land and every so often we think oh we've hit land this must be what i'm looking for instead of doing it with the, with intention and saying well you know i keep i keep doing this i keep choosing this kind of person in a relationship or i keep choosing jobs that are unsatisfying or whatever situation is um look at what's happening what's the pattern and then what does that tell you about what you're working on deep down inside you know if you if you always end up with a cheater. It's a sign maybe that you're working through betrayal and trust issues. Um, And then maybe then then it becomes really important that, you know, the primary thing when you meet somebody is you have to feel that they've got, they're somebody you can trust, they're true to the word. I find that sometimes we can be on such a hair trigger around something like betrayal, that if you meet somebody and uh, they say they'll meet you at 8 o'clock and they turn up at 8.15, they go, hey, I'm only 15 minutes late. It's no big deal. But you go, oh my God, if, they, if they'll be, you know, out of integrity in on, in that area, what else can I trust them with? You know, these these little things can be signs of something much bigger. How did you come up with the ten levels 
of a soul's experience. And if you could give a brief breakdown of what they are, you indicated when you kind of looked into my record that I was 40% into a level 10. If you could create some context for people that are unfamiliar with that part of your work. Sure. Um, so yeah, when I was, uh, working with my spirit guides, uh, initially sort of very early on, they, they talked about this system they wanted to pass on to me. It's called the instruction. And it's just, um, it, it's, it's a way to define the elements of your soul's life plan. So you can look at, uh, things like soul age, which is what you're asking about, soul type, the personality, and all the influences that go with that. But the spirit guides divide everything up into 10, not because it's a magical number. It's just a convenient way to do it. Any less than that, and you don't have enough detail. Any more than that, and you're starting to micromanage. So um, it's a convenient number to break everything into. So you, you can tell what your past life fears are. Everything is, there's 10 of, of everything, and it's, it's a system... Um, I was just talking to my wife last night about it. I, so far, I haven't found any flaw in it um, since since I was given it. You know, I don't know, fifteen years, twenty years ago. Um, it's it seems to be like a you know just a, a beautifully crafted way of understanding who we are. Um, one thing that people often say when they've read my, particularly my first book, The Instruction, they say, "Gosh, it's uh, so well organized." And I go, well, no, "I'm not. You know, I just have." very, very organized spirit guides because I, I'm totally not that, that person. But the system was really, really helpful for me. Um, and I, so I use that as a sort of foundation for the work. But, um, you know, of course, it goes you know, a, lot, a lot broader than that. The soul ages you were asking about, um, if you think of it, like I, I usually say if you're a really old soul, you're probably on life 110, 120, but we're all different. You know, and it depends. Some people are slow learners. You could be on life 150, but you know, something of that nature. Um, and so you have multiple lifetimes at each one of these 10 levels and a different focus each. You know, so level 10 soul, um, most of the people I work with are level eight, nine, 10, but mostly level nine. Uh, I say mostly nine, then a lot of tens. And so a level 10 soul, you know, you're working on often wrapping up a lot of experiences from, from the, the, the past. It's time to really work on yourself, uh, self-development, and also very personal creativity as well can be very important for, for old souls. Um, they often, you know, want to do their, their own thing. It could be artists or something. They're really feeling it. They, they, there's some need to get like a personal expression of creativity out there. Um, level nine souls, um, they're very much usually on the spiritual path. And uh, sometimes it's expressed through religion, or through religion, but usually as the soul gets older, it tends to uh, consider itself to be a little bit more spiritual rather than religious. A lot of that's to do with just, it, it's not about religion itself, it's about religious dogma. And it's, it, the older soul tends to be questioning so much more. And so if somebody just presents this whole package, they kind of go, well, I mean, I kind of like that bit, but I don't like that, you know. So they do tend to cherry pick their beliefs a little bit more. If you're a level eight soul, it's all about relationships. It's about to, to, uh, overcoming issues around rejection and so on. And so having your buddies, your friends, and so on, that's all very important. Level seven is about innovation and creativity. Level six is about overcoming inf inferiority issues. So there's a different focus at every point. Once you go back, you know, five, four, three, two, one, that's young soul stuff. Do people get hung up on, um, you know, uh, valuing themselves in terms of <laughs> based on like how old, like immediately when you tell me I'm an old soul, I'm like, yeah, man, you know, I know, I know it's, it, it, it's terrible sometimes. So if I'm working with a couple, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes he's, he's the older soul, but he's not on the spiritual path. And she thinks, well, I'm on the spiritual path. I should be an older soul. It's like, oh, it's not a competition. You know, it just is what it is. It's, so it would be well advised then to uh, eliminate that train of thought from one's experience as they begin to explore <laughs> this element of life um, in that you wouldn't look at a five-year-old kid and devalue them um, as being less substantial or have uh, less value than a 10-year-old. 
But well, that's that's absolutely that's that's something I feel is so important. That yes, you wouldn't say to your seven year old to help. You mean you can't drive the car? What's wrong with you? You know, you understand that you were, there's some limitations there, and um, so I think it's I think it's very helpful because it's it's it helps you to accept others to be able to say. In fact, I was even working with somebody earlier today who's an old soul in a family of younger souls. And we were looking at, you know, a little bit of how, how can you deal with that? Some of it is to really just detach a little bit. Don't get drawn into their, you know, their, their drama uh, and so on. Um, that's actually a tough thing, by the way, for a lot of old souls uh, <clears throat> who come into this world are surrounded by younger souls. Especially when I tell people you choose your family and they go, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like crazy. Well, that makes sense. It's 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 like I'm imagining a, an analogy of a, you know a PhD scholar being thrust into a kindergarten class, sitting there going, <laughs> "What what am I doing here?" You know, it's exactly that. Um, usually, what I find is that you'll see the old soul coming into a younger soul family to try to elevate the consciousness. Now, <clears throat> it's usually with some some degree of success, even though it doesn't look like it. But often the younger souls need to be exposed to just different ways of, of thinking. Maybe, you know, one of the signs of being a level 10 soul, by the way, simple sign of being such an old soul is acceptance of others. As I always say, it would be, who cares whether you're gay, straight, black, white, whatever. Those things, you're seeing the soul beneath the surface. Yeah. And, uh, and also you're, you're, you're identifying with the, with the underdog as well. Um, you see what the... I've been using this as an example recently because I think it's it it, it really it illustrates this point. If you look at the Black Lives Matter protests in the states, the people who are out there protesting are not just black people. It's not just about you know, hey, I want you to draw this attention to me. It's it's uh, all old, older souls of all colors are are you know you've got your your soccer moms out there and dads with their leaf blowers and it's like um and it's so there there's with you being an older soul it tends to be a greater altruism so and the awareness that what's happening to somebody else could be happening to you and it probably did in a previous lifetime sure. and that it's it's incumbent upon us as old souls to help one another and i think it's a really cheering thing and it's a good sign of the transformation the shift in consciousness that's happening that we get um, so many people out there on the streets risking their their health and safety, even though they, they don't necessarily have any skin in the game, as it were. You know, they they're doing it for other people because it's the right thing to do, and that's a that's a real old soul sort of thing. But the soul's journey, I'll say, it takes it from a place of fear to to love, and so that shows up as generally uh, going from maybe. More sort of fundamentalist, more religious, to more spiritual, or from more, more conservative to more progressive. Um, that's just as the soul's perception. Uh, if everything opens up, if through experience it learns that, like you know the the downtrodden woman that you were in a past life is no different from the person you are now. You know, that if you see somebody who's being mistreated, your heart goes out to them. And you're meant to do something. You know, when we're talking about how you look at young souls, maybe the same way you would look at a seven-year-old, five-year-old, um, and to understand that, yeah, they're just at a different place in their journey. It doesn't necessarily mean condoning it. Like if, you're, if your five-year-old flushes your watch down the toilet, you don't kind of go, oh, you know, bless his little head. He was just, he's just a five-year-old. Um, you, you would want to... Explain to your child, this is not what you do. You know, this is, this is not acceptable. And so, you know, people often say, well, how should we deal with younger souls? One thing for old, older souls to do is to lead by example. You know, they complain about, you know, callousness and harshness of the, the, the world or complain about things that are happening politically. And it's so important. It's like, well, make sure you're a part of the, the, the change that's happening. Make sure you're part of this upcoming transformation something i talk about a lot and um i know not everybody wants to hear it but 
you know, there's this idea that you can consider yourself spiritual if you do yoga and you meditate. And yeah, that's, that's about it. And, uh, to be truly spiritual, you really need to be benefiting other people. The techniques that we look at, things like yoga and meditation, are a means to an end more than a means, or, or just an end on, the, on their own. It's, it's like, well, what do you do as you, as you open up your consciousness and recognize that we're all connected and so on? Well, you want to do something to, to help other people. You want to get out of it with your leaf blower, if that's your, your thing or whatever. You want to get out there and be a part of you know, creating a better world. And certainly, you know, with what's happening in the world right now, um, a lot of old souls just feel like, oh, they just want to just, oh, you know, hide and hope it will all go away. But that's not what you're here for. You know, it's, it's important for you to get out uh, or in whatever way you do it. I mean, not everyone's meant to get out on the street and protest. Uh, but there's all different ways that we can help people. There's always so much need. You know, if you look at the world, if you if you're, often see it with a client, you know, they're going, oh, I don't seem to have any purpose. Well, help somebody. That would be like the very first thing, you know. There's always going to be some some need somewhere. And often it's kind of uh, karmic. It's your own thing. I was actually saying to a client last week that um, I can't remember now what the past life was, but essentially an abandoned child. And I said something to her about, you know, maybe getting involved in helping those kids who've been separated from their parents at the border, you know, put in concentration camps. That could be really healing. it. And as it turned out, she already had done that. She'd actually been down uh, volunteering in Tijuana on the other side of the border and um, really getting involved. I often find that a lot of people are already, they're already motivated to do things that are karmic, that benefit other people, uh, you know, when, or even when I tell them about it, suggest something, they go, oh, you know, I've often thought about this, I've always wanted to help, whatever it is, orphans or whatever, and they're just getting that sort of validation and, you know, hearing it from another source sometimes is all it takes to to get action going. I want to touch on... Uh, the topic of race as, as you know, obviously it's top of mind in our society right now and right. about time that it is, right? Um, that it's being addressed. Uh, uh, something that's been interesting for me is, although I have, it's my first time talking to you, I've, I have a, <laughs> a really solid felt sense that this is not my first rodeo, right? <laughs> it's not... <laughs> teachings that I've read. It's just like, mm, I've been through this before. And so when I look in the mirror, I don't see a white 49 year old American guy. I just look in my eyes and I go, ah, there you are, you little devil. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just like this form feels so temporary. And in like measure, when I see other people, and this is partially due to the way I was raised, I was raised by conscious parents who were intelligent and evolved enough to understand that the body you're in is just a shell and it doesn't matter what mm. it is and that everyone should be judged by their character rather than by whatever you know level of pigmentation they have in their skin. So that was just kind of bred into me mm. as an intellectual construct, but more of a soul knowing when I look at someone, sure, I see if they're a man or a woman or whatever they identify themselves as. And, um, you know, I, of course, am aware if one of my friends is black or Asian or white or whatever, I'm not like ignorant of the fact that the rest of the world doesn't see them as just a soul having a temporary experience as that body. But that's the way I view them. And so I find it just, and I don't know that there's a question in here, maybe you could just share your thoughts on, on this sure. observation is just <clears throat> from someone who has been subjected, let's say, to racism. To hear someone say, well, when I look at you, I don't see your color, they could misinterpret that as you're not acknowledging what I've been through in my experience. I think you're absolutely right. You have to be, yes, a little careful with that because it can be misinterpreted. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> I certainly found from my, you know, my own experience, I mean, I, I'm very well aware of my white privilege, you know, so, I mean, I've never had to, you know, worry about getting shot by a cop just because of the color of my skin or something like that. I go through my life never having to, you know, give a second thought to the color of my skin. But I have always identified with people from, you know, other countries and, you know, other skin colors and so on. Um, 
I've had a, a more lives, more past lives recently in a dark skin than uh, the very pasty white Scottish one I have this time around. And so um, it, it, it is sometimes hard to see the differences. I, I sometimes, uh, and I've talked to a couple of clients about this, who, who'd noticed the same thing, it's sometimes hard for the very old soul to be able to uh, determine. If, you, if suddenly out of the blue somebody says, you know, what, what race is so-and-so? You go, should I? Gosh, I don't know, you know, because you're not really focusing on that. The thing is that that is, can be a sign of privilege because, yeah, sure, I don't have to think about it. But loads of other people do. And, you know, it's a daily reality. And I think that's partly, you know, why it's so important that we as old souls, that we, we all are part of, you know, work to, to, to create a fairer and more equal world. I mean, we've got our, our work cut out, but we should all be doing something. Like I say, you know, to think you're spiritual just because you, you know, wish each other namaste. I mean, it's, it's not enough. I mean, it's great. It's wonderful. It's, these are all good things. I'm not knocking it. Yeah. But it's it's not enough on its own. It's really if you if you want to get to the end of this life and feel like yeah this was a really spiritual experience and I really made a difference. Well, yeah. How did how did you help other people along the way? Because imagine what I mean. I know it's idealistic, but what would the world be like if we were all doing that? Yeah. So yeah. So I, I, <clears throat> identifying with people, it's as you get to be an older soul, you're generally seeing the soul. And so, you know, like young, younger souls, they haven't learned these lessons. So they see huge differences between male and female. You know, you'll see like, you know, women are supposed to be in the home, you know, in the kitchen, barefoot, pregnant, whatever. And, you know, and then men are supposed to be this sort of way. And they see big differences, <coughs> excuse me, um, big differences in skin color, you know, um, I mean, when you when you think about it, it's it's absurd, you know. But they, but they just haven't learned that that we are all one, that we are all connected, and these are superficial differences. Like you say, it's the content of your character. That's what you know. That's what we should be focusing on. But these superficial differences, they're really a really big deal to younger souls, you know. Um, and usually, of course, there's a superiority about their own, whatever it is, you know. Like you know, that's the way you should be. So, yes, yeah, skin color, gender, religion, you know, my religion's better than yours, uh, that sort of thing. It, it's, a, it's a younger soul perspective. Yeah, that, um, that makes sense. It's sort of, a, I guess it's a spiritual maturity thing to view things in a more broad perspective from a zoomed out, uh, I guess you could say 30,000 foot view yeah. so that you are able to look at all of the moving <laughs> parts of any given dynamic and not just see the myopic part that you see in your subjective experience well you see as you as your soul ages you you really go from seeing things very much more black and white to shades of gray it's more nuanced it's interesting mm -hmm. uh also something i've pondered in terms of of race and the propensity that many humans have to get so caught up on that um in and it was kind of triggered by the comment you made about um, white privilege, you know, because of course, as all of these things have unfolded, I've observed that as a concept and see where it fits and where it doesn't uh, for me. And I think I've arrived at a, a couple levels of understanding with that. Um, I, I, I think that when people use that term, there's sometimes an implication that that person has not suffered. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or, you know, whatever privilege it could be in India, it could be you're of the upper caste. And so you have that privilege. It has nothing to do with the color of your skin. But let's just say me being a white guy. So I have a certain degree of white privilege. And then I think, well, God, I was terribly abused as a kid and I was a drug addict. And I mean, I've had horrific things done to me um, mm -hmm. by perpetrators throughout the course of my life. And I think, well, that's not very privileged. And then I thought about it and I thought, well, Sure, in this lifetime, I've suffered, uh, and suffering, I think, is subjective, by the way. I think each sure. of experience our suffering and trauma, you know, in the same degree, regardless of how it might appear from the outside. But I thought, well, that's true, I have suffered, but I don't think that I've suffered because of the color of my skin. I think that would be the, the case, yeah, absolutely. And... and I can't say that for sure, but I was never, you know, I, I've never been torn out of a car by a cop and, you know, called a racial slur or something like that, or been right. child or something like that. Um, 
and so I, I don't think that you know the suffering was caused by that. That's that's one element of it. And the other side is that um, it's like I've always kind of known that there were past lives, and so yeah. and I think about that level of privilege that someone who is a younger soul or someone who's looking at me more superficially. I always think, man, you don't know how many lifetimes I've been black, Asian, Latino, Native American, indigenous from wherever. I just happened to pop out this time as this guy, the yes. physical uh, appearance, you know, and that's not to negate that other people are, aren't suffering right now because they're in a different color body and a different life experience. But I think people that don't have the awareness or the framework to understand the multiple lifetimes and reincarnation tend to get really caught up on this on this sliver of time, this snap of a fingers that is one lifetime of you presenting in this physical form. This is, you know, it's very much, you know, uh, exactly. I mean, this is just one life out of many. Um, but you chose, you chose this location, chose the family and so on. And then, you know, a lot of times it's about really then you, you know, you want to maybe learn about the culture that you are now part of, um, the rituals and so on. It's, you know, it's all sorts of growth for the soul experiencing uh, different cultures, different places. You know, it might be a few lifetimes since you were, uh, you know, a, a, a white guy. Um, and so you're having that white guy experience this life. Next, next one, you may be a black girl somewhere. Um, so. You know, it 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 does. It, it's actually a challenge sometimes. You know that people have um, not being able to separate sometimes that past life from the present, and uh, so you you can get guilt, of course, about you know being privileged in this life. And you know, usually, I mean, it's uh, I think when you have privilege, then you really want to be helping those who are less privileged. I mean, that's that's what they also should be doing. I was actually thinking when you were talking, there's somebody I wrote about in my new book uh, that. Um, I was working with, with this client and we were talking about her daughter. She was asking me about her. And I found the most extraordinary thing. The family are Caucasian, but the, do- the daughter has had lots of um, recent past lives as, uh, as a woman of color. Um, uh, Latina, uh, Hawaiian, uh, but... Um, her experience had been, uh, it was a lot of persecution by this, this, you know, by the white patriarchy, if you like. And um, I was asking my client about this. She told me this most extraordinary thing that her, her daughter has, since the time she was really tiny, has felt ashamed about being white. She, she was like four years old and dyeing her hair black and, and darkening her skin. And, um, completely identifying with with women of color and uh n- n- now i mean she's she's now a teenager uh she still has a a problem i mean she with with the white patriarchy i mean who who, who doesn't you know but um there's but she hated her own white skin because it was a reminder of those those people and she wanted to change it to be who who she identifies with. Now she's d- d- dating a Mexican guy, and she's she's doing a fair lots of studies, but it's it's to help uh, Latino women. Uh, these things are sometimes that bleed through from a past life that we, you know, we wonder why the heck is it like I don't fit into my family, or why do I feel so different, or whatever. Sometimes, you know, again, we t- you know we talked about there is a an amnesia. We have to have, but sometimes we do remember uh, little things will will sort of break through. You'll see, of course, I mean, just we all have little reminders of past lives. It could be our taste in food or music or whatever, you know. Um, I used to joke about how I I think I was the only 16-year-old kid growing up in Scotland listening to uh, Hawaiian steel guitar music from the 1930s. And, you know, it didn't make any sense. But but then when I was able to to learn about, you know, past life in Hawaii and past life playing guitar and so on, then it sort of started to 
make a little bit more sense. But whatever we're drawn to, sometimes it's because there's something unresolved. Um, sometimes it's something that's just comfortable from a past life. Often we're relearning things that we've done before. That's why we're, you know, why we're drawn to it. And the great thing is that whatever activity you do, you can usually enhance it by tapping into a past life as well. <clears throat> like, I notice a guitar on your wall. I, I take it you play. Yeah. But you can actually use the spirit world. You can use your spirit guides to enhance your playing. You can actually ask them for, um, just ask them simply that. Just enhance my ability. Help me to even just in the moment, uh, even draw in that that energy. And sometimes, um, I was just talking to my wife last night about sometimes we both noticed how we will write something and then when we look back on it, sometime, you know, it could be months later, we go, I don't remember writing that, but boy, that was a pretty, that was pretty smart. I like the way I did that. That's where you're really getting a lot of help there. You know, it's like you're getting help from the other side. And sometimes when you do that, the things don't go into the memory banks quite, quite the same. It's a, it's a form of channeling anyway. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the reminder of that. You know, there I think there are certain creative activities in which I seek inspiration actively mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. And then there's other things. And it's funny that you mentioned music because that's one I've never really, well, I don't want to say never, but it's more rare that I'll be aware of inspiration, of divine inspiration in that area. And exceedingly mm -hmm. rare that I'll in fact go so far as to say, hey, can you help me figure this piece out? Or can I'm stuck on this thing? Or where should I go from here? I, I don't really think of that. Whereas I do mm -hmm. more so in a podcast recording or writing something or you know, creating some other type of content or art. So that's a really good reminder. I want to touch back on something as you were describing that little girl who had had many lifetimes as a woman of color and is now a white girl and having this sense of guilt or self-loathing as a result of that. That was a poignant because I observe a lot of that, and maybe it's a younger soul uh, phenomenon generally, but because of the the racism that's been brought to the surface in our culture and our awareness now, that's existed, you know, forever probably on mm -hmm. all sides. You know, all people have, I'm sure, been discriminated against uh, throughout history for whatever reason. But mm -hmm. right now, we're we're looking at, um, you know, Black American people and all this, and so I see. Um, a pretty large number of well-meaning white people going into this mm, kind of self-loathing or, or guilt energy field, which I think is well-meaning. But to me, that level of consciousness is very low in power. and is, it, it, it goes nowhere. You know, right. it's, whereas like self-love and going like, hey, here I am in this body and I acknowledge that my life experience could have been easier and is perhaps easier than other people's who are in a different type of body. And it seems to me the higher perspective and the most effective way to bring about change and support and service of those in need is really in a depth of self-acceptance and self-love and finding compassion and empathy for those others and using whatever privilege you may or may not have to actually affect change. Could you talk about you know, the, the difference between that 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 lower state of guilt versus the empowerment of loving who you are and therefore being able to love others fully for who they are? Well, I think you, you just said it all. I mean, that's perfect. That's how, you know, I think you said it more eloquently than I could. But absolutely. Um, you know, it's something a lot of old souls do is they, they, they can judge themselves very harshly um, that can be a lot of a lot of um, past life fears get turned inwards by old souls. Um, so judgment they become very almost like their own worst critic as well. Um, oh gosh, I mean, there's there's so much in in what you're talking about there. Self love, um, you know, I've, I I struggled with that for for decades, um, and I had a girlfriend when I was back around age of 30 and she was saying to me you know your problem is you need to learn to love yourself and I was kind of going oh great you know what do I do with that bit of information <laughs> you know it's like sure but no idea how to how to even begin and I think a lot of it comes from recognizing that you're if you if you see other people as valuable and want to express love for humanity it includes you you know don't don't leave yourself out 
there are also fast track ways to, I mean, not the only ways, but there's some fast track ways to really develop greater self-love. One of them is, uh, it's about the thoughts that you hold, thoughts about other people. Because a lot of times we're carrying around a lot of, you know, little negative feelings about people and resentment. Some of it, of course, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, we can't all get away from completely from judging others. I mean, how do we learn about them if we don't, you know? So, um, but one of the things that can really help is through sort of a kind of forgiveness when somebody's a jerk to you, it may be to say, uh, not to say it's okay, it's not about condoning anything, but to be able to say, yeah, your soul wouldn't want, to, want you to do that. You know, no soul wants to, to behave badly to another. It's always coming from the, the, the conscious part of you or the effects of the fear on the conscious mind. And so, you know, if you've been, in, uh, I don't know, a downtrodden servant in the past life, you might have a tendency to want, you know, put other people down. Um, because it elevates you, you know, uh, it's not, it's certainly not a way to do it. So things like good thoughts about people, uh, looking for the good in people, that can really help. It's sort of just a way of just, you know, clearing out some of the negativity and opening up your heart chakra. And uh, of course, I talked about it before, but, you know, anything that you can do where you feel like you're helping others, especially where there's a real genuine need. You know, I was working with somebody who was, uh, she, uh, we we're talking about volunteer work that she needed to do for karmic reasons. And she said, well, I, I volunteer in my kid's school. And well, nobody in that school, they're all this wealthy school. They're none of these pe- people, you know, these sons and daughters of millionaires were really in, you know, dire straits. It was really more about finding people who, who really need help, who, who need the support of somebody else to be able to maybe, you know, manifest what they're here to do in this life or simply be happy so um little things that you do for other people good thoughts um all these things help to develop self-love it, it opens up the heart chakra and as you do open up the heart chakra to others it, it it reflects on you as well do people who have neglected to evolve in a lifetime or in a series of lifetimes and uh, continue to be stuck at that same level, do they tend to have to stay around longer before entering the causal plane and moving on to that? And if, yeah. if one is, you know, I'll use an extreme example, if one has manifested in this lifetime as an Adolf Hitler, I mean, like, how long are they going to be stuck here going around and around, you know, the the bottom of the rubbish bin before they are able to elevate up and get out of here because there's so much bad karma that's been created. Or I don't say bad karma, but maybe perhaps so much negative karma that's been There's negative karma, yes. Right. So are some people just perpetually kind of stuck here in the human purgatory uh, because they've done so poorly at evolving? Well, the... The the interesting thing about this process, and as far as I understand it, when you process a life on the astral plane, is that um, what your soul will try to do after figuring out, you know, oh my God, I, you know, created all this havoc and and so on, it will then just say, well, how do we how do we start balancing some of that karma? The important thing to to always remember is that karma is not about punishment because it would be so unfair for uh, the, you know, some poor little girl being, you know, born and raised in that right now at this moment in New York City. And she's been visited by all these horrible things because she happened to be Adolf Hitler in a previous lifetime. That would be very unki- un- unkind. I mean, she she didn't do anything to make that happen, but the soul did. It's, it's all, um, and the soul will quite pragmatically say, how do we balance what we did? Because it really, once you understand karma being all about balance, it, it starts to make sense. Unfortunately, some people don't like the fact that, well, oh, so you're telling me Hitler's not being punished? Well, you know, well, you know uh, that soul will have to, you know, it's, it's learning some tough lessons. I mean, it's, it's you know, to, to go to the other side and find out that you were that person who did such awful things can be, okay, it's a tough thing to have to deal with but the soul is always pragmatic and it will say well how do we balance this so humanitarian work lives as a doctor surgeon helping people um often learning really important lessons in altruism and these are all just different ways 
of, of balancing that out. And of course, it will take some people a lot longer than others. It, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that you come in, it's like a horse race. You come in with all these other souls and then off we go and, you know, one falls at the first fence and then it takes a while and others are moving forward. Somebody gets to the finishing line lifetimes and lifetimes before you and you're struggling, you know, where it just really depends on what lessons your soul feels it needs to learn and how much karma it needs to offer back to, to balance things. So, yeah, you, you, you can get some people that are getting to the end of the, the race, like it could be 4,000 years and somebody else taking like 6,000 years to get to that same point. You know, it's not all the time spent on the physical plane. It's the time it's spent on the, like I was thinking of going from physical to astral, physical, astral, and, and so on. But yes, some people, some souls, even though you look at life and think, well, nothing happened, there's no growth or whatever, there always is. No matter what you're doing, no matter how, how much of a flat line that life will seem, there's always lessons that you can draw from it. But some, some lifetimes are full on, full of lessons, full of growth. And others are more, yeah, they meander very slowly. There's many different reasons for that. That's really interesting because in this lifetime that I'm experiencing now, um, I've had the opportunity to expand and elevate my consciousness a lot in a short period of time. And um, much of that was brought about as a result of becoming an absolutely incorrigible alcoholic and drug addict. And I, which is my really my greatest gift ever, as weird as that might sound. But uh, because that way of life became so unbearable uh, at 26 years old, I very earnestly and humbly sought out a spiritual solution to that problem. And I was mm -hmm. absolved of that obsession and relieved of that bondage. And I've been a free man ever since. Hallelujah. In the time, which is almost 24 years since that experience transpired and it's all unfolded when really kind of God and, and spirit was revealed to me to be intrinsically present and valid, I've had the sense that I've not been able to overcome that particular adversity uh, many times before. Like I get the sense that I've been an alcoholic a bunch of times and just died in the gutter or, you know, Oh my gosh. Been, yeah. been or the, you know, wherever alcoholics, I mean, well, you're from Scotland. There's, there's no, short <laughs> oh, no, it's no, no raised by an alcoholic. I mean, I, I, I yeah, been there now. Um, you looked into that at all with your guides, that specifically the the uh, path of addiction or alcoholism and totally. just repeat it over and over <laughs> again until we kind of like pull our head out of our ass? Yeah, again, that's one of those things that, yeah, you can, um, you know, the patterns that you get into, they're not just in this life, but they're from one lifetime to the next. So one of the things that happens is that if you found in a past life and could go back, let's say, 500 years, you found that the answer to your problems was to get drunk, you know, like just numb out. Then that will be when you're going through a crisis, any stressful period in your life. That's where the soul will go to it, look back on the past, and then that will become the default way of dealing with it. I see this with things like suicide as well, like um, people who've killed themselves with pills and alcohol in the past life. If they ever think about taking their life in them this time around, it would be the go-to thing would be pills and alcohol because that's what's sort of up as it works, what the soul finds when it looks back. Um, so a few things about alcoholism, and this would definitely apply to, to you, is that the freedom thing is so important. And very often teenagers wanting to express their freedom are the first to smoke and drink because they're going... No one's going to tell me what to do. Don't, you know, don't tell me what to do. Don't fence me in. Just smoke, drink. And, and ironically, they, they end up becoming very often victims of the, once again, you know, they're put into that sort of, they're vic victim of a substance, but they go back into that victim place that they were, the powerlessness place that they were in a past life. And, uh, there's another thing that comes, I see this very commonly. If somebody's died where, in a past life where alcohol was a factor, then the soul will try to keep alcohol out of your system. And it will do that by uh, a couple of ways. One, it will maybe try to 
um, affect your tolerance, the body's tolerance for alcohol. Sometimes people who can only have one drink and then they throw up or they get a hangover, it's the soul going, we're not going to have that happen again. The other thing is that you can often get two people who go out and tie one on. One wakes up in the morning and goes, hey, what a, what a great night that was. And the other one goes, oh, God, I feel so bad about myself. And the remorse is, a, uh, you know, that alcoholic remorse is a way that the soul tries to get you to limit your behavior, stop it in some way. Um, whatever happens, the soul will generally not want you to go into a place of victimization because then you're stuck again. It will always try to get you tr to transcend any any problem that you have. Unfortunately, as you find out, and a lot of people do, you sometimes have to go really deep into that hole to be then to catapulted back out and, you know, fresh new future. Is there a difference between a soul and a spirit? Not, not in my understanding. Just the way it's presented to me is that it'd be interchangeable. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there's a couple of quick questions I have here before we wrap it up because I know you've been very generous with your time and I appreciate it. This, all of these topics are extremely fascinating to me and hopefully the audience as well as I sense they will be. I hope so. Uh, in terms of the soul guides, something that's always been a bit of a curiosity to me is the human tendency to lack discernment and prudence when evaluating the true nature or consciousness of another person that is in a body incarnated here, right? We're typically quite gullible as a species. We fall for a lot of <laughs> shenanigans, right? By right. this forces here on earth. I've therefore not been in a big hurry to test my discernment by transmitting a beacon out into the spirit world, into those other realms, in that if I can't even determine who's a good person here, how am I going to be able to determine spirits on the other side in terms of their benevolence or malevolence, as the case may be? Have you ever encountered spirits that have, or guides that have revealed themselves to be of you know, lacking love, I don't like to use the word evil, but that, that lack love or em empathy that, that don't have your best intention or the best intentions of humankind uh, at, at their core. Well, th I've, I've certainly encountered what my spirit guys would call mischievous astral plane entities. And, but one thing they always stress is that if you're talking to a spirit guide, spirit guides have no other agenda than to help you. And so um, if you get anything that's not helpful, it could come from a, like some entity on the other side, but not a spirit guide. Because I've, I've had people say that to me, oh, my spirit guides told me it's something really negative. And I go, well, no, they didn't, you know, because they just literally wouldn't do that. It's not how they, how they work. If it's a guide, it's going to be positive and helpful and useful. Um, but, you know, uh, there are, as my spirit guides say, that are jerks on this plane, they're jerks on the next. You know, <laughs> so uh, not everyone in spirit is spiritual, is another thing that they've said. Uh, I, I had a, in the very early days, I'd, I'd probably been talking with my spirit guides for like a year or two. And uh, then I, it's one day I get this spirit who comes in, he goes, okay, just for the near future, we've, we've all decided that, you know, I'll be your, your go to guy. And uh, I was a little, I mean, I was naive, you know, but I was flattered. Oh, gosh, how special, you know. And then this, you know, within minutes, this spirit guide is saying, ask me questions. Do you, do you know what a trifecta is? And I'm going, no, I've never heard of it. Do you know what a perfecta is? I'm going, no. Do you know what a daily double is? I'm going, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's all horse racing terms, betting, betting terms. And then the, the spirit is going, listen, I, not having a body, I, I can't go to the track, but I wonder if you could take me to the track. <laughs> I'm going, no, Jesus. Oh, I'm just, I, I felt suckered, you know, I felt like, like such a, <laughs> such an idiot, you know, but, um, you know, and, I, and that taught me, it was, it was a lesson about my ego as well. So I mean, flattered by some, some spirit on the other side who really wasn't, not acting in my highest interest. He just wanted to go horse racing. So, um, 
you know, yes, there there can be sort of negative entities. Well, you know, if somebody was asking me about this yesterday, they'd sort of felt like something attaching to themselves. What the spirit guides always say is they can't hurt you. I mean, it's just you have the power. You know, I mean, the only way can, they can hurt you is to give you bad advice or to scare you. But um, if you detect any information coming from the other side that's not useful, helpful, and kind of essentially loving, then it's not coming from any source that you need to pay attention to. And if you do get that sort of coming through, just send it on its way. Go to the light, you know, expressions like that. In terms of uh, <clears throat> beings or, or conscious entities in those other planes of reality, it sounds like your spirit guides have been within this system of human incarnation, reincarnation, and then pass on to those higher realms and... yeah found out there to be of service to those of us still here. Have you ever encountered or are you aware of entities that exist outside of the human incarnation in terms of, I don't, you know, I don't want to say the word aliens because there really are no aliens. We're all in this one universe. Right, yeah. uh, have there been any indications that there are any like ETs that are outside of this cycle or in another cycle, but are still able to permeate that veil and reach you or reach other people. And the reason I ask this is I've had, I've never had like a UFO experience or something of that nature. But um, again, during different plant mo- uh, plant medicine ceremonies, I have definitely had the sense that I'm communicating with consciousness or with beings that are not of the human realm. And they've been just completely of light and unconditionally loving and very healing. Uh, but the way they presented it, it was definitely clear to me, or at least it appeared to be clear to me that they weren't of this realm, that they were from somewhere else, of somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And it was a, you know, needless to say, on multiple occasions, a really profound experience to have that, not as a concept, but as something that I was subjectively experiencing in that moment. Well, souls um, exist in in numbers that uh, my spirit guides say can't, it, there's not even a way to describe how many souls are out there in the universe. A part of a conscious consciousness that they describe permeating the entire universe. And now I never, my spirit guides have given me a narrow purview. There's, there's things that people ask me about all the time. Aliens, Atlantis, um, my spirit guys won't go there because they, 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 this is not what I do. My my purpose is to explore past lives to help people to understand the present, and you know it's everything about life purpose and, and so on. Uh, so when it gets into that sort of thing, I really don't know because they they won't discuss it. I was thinking about this earlier that at one time when I was really pressing the guys, I went, you know, for God's sake, you must have some idea if Atlantis existed or not. So, I mean, like, where was it? And they they go like just to shut me up is like a New Jersey and I'm going what look it doesn't matter you know it's like it's not what you do yeah but New Jersey um, it was just a so certainly there of course there's alien life force whether they they're connecting with us here how they do I don't know it's really not my purview as they would say not not some something I'm guided to to explore but. Um, why not? When you're when you're tapping into like this universal consciousness, I can't see why. I once asked my spirit guides. It was actually in response to a question a client asked me. They said, uh, "Could could I read somebody from Mars? I mean, if I was on Mars and they were on Earth, could I could I read them like I'm doing? Because people think I have to be in their presence, but everything I do is on the phone. It doesn't matter. Like it's it's all coming from the guides anyway." And I said, could I do it from Mars? And they said, well, it's a little impractical. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, theoretically, it could be anywhere. It could be anywhere in the universe because that ability to connect te- telepathically, if you like, is is not dependent on geographical location. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure if that's your experience, if that's where you feel you're tapping into it. And I think often it makes people overanalyze. And if your gut feeling is that that's what you're tapping into, I would say that's what that's. That's it. Trust your, trust your intuition on that one. Cool. 
And the last thing I'm going to ask you is uh, if you indicated earlier that I was a uh, 40% into level 10, when someone's at that that final level in your system being the number 10, uh, would that be indicative of the fact that they're almost done with the incarnation cycle and they're ready to move on to the next phase? Or would one stay in multitudes of level 10 for the next few thousand years until they pass on? Or is that the final stage according to your framework? My my experience has been that uh, usually somebody's 40% or 50% in, and the spirit guides give these percentages multiples of 10 just for convenience. They, they speak broadly to where roughly where you are in the in the journey but also they do say something about what you're working on like i say so for you it's a lot about learning it's a lot about imparting knowledge um or exposing others to knowledge or however you want it to be not not like i say in a high school setting or that sort of thing it, that would feel a little too mundane it's it's just more you know getting stuff getting information out into the world uh, i haven't seen a 40% soul who's more than likely done with this life. Now, you don't know until you process the life, so I can never tell. People say, am I done? This is my last life. Could be. But usually you get sense to run about 40%. You've probably got one or two lifetimes, but you don't have to go through 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and then 90 and then out. I'll see people at 70% who are probably close enough done as I usually say to them, don't go committing murder or anything. You then have to come back and work on all the karma. <laughs> you know, so right. you see that with old souls. Sometimes they're, they're staying out of trouble. You know, they don't want to do too. They don't want to get too much involved in the world. And really, deep down, the soul's going here. Yeah, if we just sort of stay, keep ourselves to ourselves, and stay out of trouble, maybe we can get out of this at, at the end. But like I say, until you process on the astral plane and figure out what you've learned and what you still need to learn then you don't really know for sure. So I can never tell somebody, yeah, this this is your last life. But I can say, probably, possibly. And it's amazing that one of the signs that this is possibly your last life is when people use the term home. They'll say to me, oh, yeah, I just want to go home. And it's, it's extraordinary. I can't tell you how often I've heard that. I mean, what a, a what a weird thing to think of the this other plane of existence as home. But, you know, it's part of that thing. Like you were saying, we're here temporarily in this, in this body, in this one place. Next life will be completely different. At home, because it, the, the, I think the, the astral plane becomes much more comfortable when you've died many, many times, you come back and forth. Usually old souls don't have a particularly strong fear of death because you've done it so often. <laughs> it can be, usually be like a fear of the means of death, like, oh, you know, like, please, I don't want to drown again, you know, or, or whatever. Like, you know, there can be such certain fears about means of death. Coronavirus is bringing up a lot of people who've had pneumonia, emphysema, stuff like that in the past, have a fear of dying, not being able to breathe like they, like they had in a past life. It can, that idea can create a little bit of a, a panic. Uh, so sometimes the means of death, uh, I often say that the difference between a young soul and an old soul when it comes to death is the young soul goes, I don't want to die. And the, the old soul goes, I don't want to die right now. It's like, usually it's like, I've got things to do. Right, right. Mm. I remember when my grandmother uh, on my dad's side was close to death. She died at 99. And the past, uh, or the last couple of years when I'd visit her, say, how you doing? And she was just bored, you know? She just yeah. was like, what am I, st-? I mean, she would say something to the effect <laughs> You know, I'm just getting bored. Like I'm ready to go. She didn't use the word home, but she's just like, yeah. there's no reason to be here anymore. I'm done. I'm I'm ready to check out. And I thought that was so most fatalistic in my 20s hearing that. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? You're you're willing to die? You're ready to die? Are you suicidal or something? And you know, now my <laughs> understanding, of course, is a bit more broad. And that she was just like, yeah, we're we're done with this lesson. <laughs> this chapter. Yeah, le- le- lessons learned. You know, it's uh, my my job here is done. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. All right, my final question for you, my friend, is uh, you've taught me so much today as you have our uh, our fortunate listeners who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life and your work that we might be able to go learn from as well. Oh, gosh. Some psychic, I didn't see that one coming. Okay, let me have a think about... Um, <clears throat> the funny thing is, I was, you know... Just again, one of these things I was just talking to my wife about is uh, she she finds me like a little 
weird, like, you know, psychic and spiritual world, but I'm not particularly drawn to reading psychic uh, or spiritual material, rather. Um, but I went through a period where I did, but I crammed it all into like a few months. And then once I was able to talk to spirit guides, they were my go-to, you know. So um, I would say that I think there's, uh, I mean, there's so much good spiritual material out there. I think it's sometimes a little hard to, you know, figure out, you know, what what is worthwhile and you have to sort of explore a little bit. But there's, you know, some good spiritual writers. Um, I mean, I think like a lot of people, you know, um, many lives, many masters, you know, Brian Weiss, I think that was, uh, uh, that sort of opened my eyes to a, to a lot of stuff. Um, I find some useful information from, uh, I think, it, again, opening my eyes, some of uh, Raymond Moody's stuff. I, I, I read a lot of that when, when I was really getting interested in this work, and it sort of, uh, yeah, seemed to um, help. I think, uh, you know, I, I find myself reading, uh, I mean, I'm kind of curious about people who've had interesting lives and really made a difference. So, you know, reading um, about Gandhi, who is a bit of flawed, you know, wasn't a perfect person, but there's a lot of important lessons there. So I like to read about people like uh, Nelson Mandela, these these people who have more altruistic spiritual uh, influences on us, and 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 that's what I find really interesting. You know what? I mean, especially somebody who could spend you know decades in prison and then come out and still be so connected to humanity. I mean, what an amazing person Nelson Mandela was. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, those are, those are great answers. Thank you. And then finally, where can people find your work, websites, books, social media, all of that stuff when they want to learn more about you and your... Okay. Well, uh, ainsleymcleod.com is my main website. I have uh, my new book, The Old Souls Guidebook. And if you just go to oldsoulsguidebook.com, uh, there's a link there. There's also a shop on my main website. Um, I have a membership program which uh, where we we explore topics every month, and uh, we're looking at this month what it is to be an empath and uh, everything related to that. I think old souls, a lot of old souls, will relate to that. Um, so we start with a, a class. We have daily messages from the spirit guides. We have uh, uh, a past life regression every month. We have a Q and A, and lots of other little things. We have a forum, uh, sort of secret members only hangout where. Old souls can go and talk about weird things like spirit guides without anyone thinking they're crazy. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, Instagram means Lee underscore McLeod. Um, yeah. Awesome. I think awesome. that should be, should be some way to find me amongst all of that. Of course, all of those links will be in our show. Our show notes for people that are listening. Uh, man, what a pleasure to get to hang out with you today. Well, it's, it's been my pleasure. I mean, really, uh, uh, thank you. Great questions. And I love talking about my work. So thank you for letting me. It's fun. I mean, I, you know, I could go on about these types of uh, topics all day long. So it's just, uh, yeah. it's great to be able to spread out and have plenty of time to cover everything I could ever want to cover. And I'm sure when we uh, hang up, I'll think of 10 more things, but we'll do it again sometime. And we'll do it again. Yeah. And I just appreciate the work you're doing in the world. And I, I celebrate anyone and everyone who's doing whatever they can to uplift uh, humanity and uh, to ease suffering because God knows we have enough of it. So thank you for your commitment to doing so. Well, thank you for all that you're doing too. All right. I'll really look, making a difference. Thanks, brother. I look forward to speaking to you soon. I look forward to it. Take care and thanks again. Thank you. Well, that was a wild ass ride, wasn't it, man? I was so excited to talk to Ainsley. What a cool dude. Uh, For those of you that are listening, know that you can watch this and every episode of the Lifestylist podcast on video. And uh, I got to say, while this one was Zoom, I really felt like I was in the room with Ainsley. I always prefer to do them in person, but due to travel restrictions, et cetera, this one was remote and it didn't even make a difference. And I think based on that conversation, um, we can all understand now that uh, (laughs) location, space, and time are in fact constructs. And that was proven to me by the intimacy and just amazing vibe that we were able to pull together for this conversation. So I'm forever grateful to have had the opportunity 
and even more grateful that you were able to join us. Speaking of joining us, don't forget to check in next Tuesday. I'm telling you, man, you don't want to miss this one. Dr. Craig Conover, cutting edge performance medicine, peptides, NAD, ketamine. We talk about some next level stuff, uh, spraying oxytocin up your nose. <laughs> Just It's wild. It's a super wild show next Tuesday. A complete departure from this topic, but I like to mix it up. You know, I, I, I try my best to alternate from shows around personal development, spirituality, relationships, et cetera, uh, and then throw in some, you know, some of the hardcore biohacking stuff, but not just any biohacking stuff. I'm looking for the next level people. And next week's guest, Dr. Craig Conover is one of the top guys in the world. And I'm sure many people, you know, in the health scene um, are in touch with him and working with him. M- most people I know do. Ben Greenfield, uh, Aubrey Marcus, all these guys. Craig is the go-to dude in that realm and uh, for good reason. And he's also just a really sweet and spiritual guy also, which is fun. You know, I love it when I get to interview scientists and uh, and brilliant people who are also very conscious. And that's, that's a bit rare these days, I think. And um, I'm finding them where they're coming to me or being found for me. So I'm really stoked. And uh, speaking of stoked, you know, at the end of the shows, I always thank our sponsors. And I, I don't just do it by rote. I want you to know that I really do appreciate our sponsors and I appreciate that you support them. Uh, believe it or not, and for those of you that have ever tried to start a podcast, it's quite expensive to run a podcast, especially uh, if you do it well and you have some degree of quality control and you put some time into production value when it comes to video, graphic design, show notes, transcripts. We now have complete transcripts, by the way, of every single episode at lukestory.com. So every word spoken on the show is now available to you on the post for each podcast. And it's pretty obvious to find there if you look for the podcast you want the show notes for. If you're on the newsletter, which you can get at lukestory.com slash newsletter, uh, then you're going to get the show notes sent to you every week with a link to the transcripts. So we are always improving the back end of the podcast and making sure that this content is delivered to you in the most concise and, uh, and digestible way. So for that, we got to pay. And how we pay is sponsors pay me to talk about their products on the show. But what's cool, unlike the antiquated advertising, the days of television of old, I actually use and believe in every single product that I talk about on the show. So to me, it's, uh, it's kind of fun because I get to try stuff out if I like it. This is the way it works. Let me just break it down. A company will approach me and say, hey, we know about your podcast. We like it. We think your audience would dig our stuff. We want to send you some product. Have you tried it out? If you like it, we'll run some ads. And they send their stuff. And I'd say most of the time, I mean, a good 90% of the time, they send their products and it's pretty awesome. And then we do run ads. And I become an affiliate and put them on my web store, lukestory.com slash store, which by the way, you can always find all of our sponsors there. And then we live happily ever after. Now there is, you know, probably 10% of the products or so I'm guesstimating that come in and they just don't fit my, you know, my vibe or my stringent standards for ingredients and manufacturing and sourcing and environmental concerns, et cetera. So I want you to know that if something slips through the cracks here and uh, ends up on the show, that it is legit and I stand behind it 100%. As is the case with today's three sponsors, we've got Blue Blocks. They make some fantastic blue blocking eyewear. Shit, I should be wearing my blue blockers right now because I have bright lights on and it's uh, 9, 16 p.m. But I can't reach down in the drawer right now because I'll probably drop the mic. So I'm just going to rough it. (laughs) But I wish I had my blue blocks on right now. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com great glasses, completely affordable. They're going to change your life. If you're not blocking blue light at night, and I'm not trying to shame you or like guilt, you do whatever you want. But if you're someone that's concerned about health and you're laboring over the right diet and should you be vegan or paleo or carnivore or whatever, uh, in my humble opinion, if you're missing the blue light thing, um, you're missing a huge part of your health because your circadian biology depends on the temperature of light that enters your eye and hits your skin at the right time of day. So it's about the right color or temperature of light at the right time. And you can manipulate time and space, man, 
by wearing your Blue Blocks glasses. The code there is Lifestylist, and that saves you 15% off at blueblocks.com. And we've got some fantastic probiotics and immune products over at uh, justthrivehealth.com. That's justthrivehealth.com. They make a fantastic spore-based probiotic that is not a waste of money. You take these pills, they hatch inside of you like little baby aliens and uh, and populate your gut with uh, what we would call, I don't really believe in good and bad bacteria, but uh, let's just say they improve gut dysbiosis and create balance in your GI tract. Now, unlike a lot of probiotics that you swallow and you just poop out because your digestive juices and such kill them. That doesn't happen to these robust little uh, spore-based probiotics at justthrivehealth.com. If you want to check them out, your stomach will thank me. And the code there is Luke15 to save 15% off. And then finally, beekeepersnaturals.com, the best honey products in the freaking world. They are glyphosate and pesticide-free, which is really important. By the way, whether you buy beekeepers or not, um, I'm just going to let you in a little secret right here because I've interviewed the founder and I study up on bees because our entire food supply depends on bees, which is why I'm so anti um, cell tower <laughs> and 5G because it's killing off the bees. And if the bees are gone, we're gone. Totally different topic. But something that you might not know, a little tidbit of very depressing information is that even if you get organic honey, if your bees are raised on an organic honey farm or whatever they call it, is it a farm? A giant hive, a hive pod? Uh, well, guess what? Bees travel and they fly, I think it's like up to six miles or something. I forget. Don't quote me on that part. But what I do know is that if the neighboring farm is spraying, spraying uh, Roundup, glyphosate, other pesticides, the bees will go over there and uh, nectar up on those toxic flowers and then bring those pesticides back into their quote, end quote, organic hive. So it's very problematic. A lot of the bees are not only being harmed, but they're creating honey products that are very toxic, even if they're labeled organic. So you want to find a product that tests for pesticides. That's what's really important. And also one that is supporting small beekeepers and all that good stuff as beekeepers naturals most certainly are. If you want to try their bee products, they've got bee pollen, honey, propolis, all the good stuff. You can find it at beekeepersnaturals.com. And if you use the code LIFESTYLIST, you will save 15% off, which is a really good discount uh, because the high quality bee products can add up. Cool thing though about bee products I've noticed is they really last a long time. It's not like you're going to eat 50 tablespoons of pollen, you know, one tablespoon, boom, once a day, you're good. Teaspoon of their honey or their propolis or something like that. Uh, It's very potent, very concentrated. So that's the stuff I'm into right now. And uh, with that, my, my friends, I'm going to let you go. And I'll look forward to being back with you on Tuesday. And I'm really excited about the episodes coming up throughout the rest of 2020, despite this being a completely insane year. I think the thing that's keeping my boots on the ground and preventing me from jumping off a bridge is uh, the fact that I have this show and I continue to meet and interview so many inspiring, beautiful souls like Ainsley and uh, get to share them with you. So thank you so much for your support. Stay safe out there. We'll see you Tuesday. 